Um, I have started the recording. I, um, we started a meeting about a minute ago. It was uh, opened, uh, seconded, and we said the pledge, and now I turn the recording on. So here we are. This is the June 17th, 2021, uh, New Paltz Town Board as Police Commission meeting. And so with that, um, I would like to make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Any opposed? Okay, uh, announcements over to you, uh, Chief. Just a few announcements. Um, the first is the, the conversations with the police that our monthly program is continuing. Uh, we met yesterday at the Water Street Market. Um, we had uh, two people that had uh, showed up, but we actually uh, crashed <laughs> a gathering of some people that I know. So we had about four, uh, about six people in total and it was, it was good. Um, but we're going to you know, continue these. They're the third Wednesday of the month. Uh, I would just encourage people to check our website. Uh, we try to make notification in the paper as well. Uh, we we, we um, change up the times and the locations so that we can try to catch as many people as we can with these. Um, but it's something we're going to continue. Um, the next announcement I have is that uh, June 25th at 1 p.m. will be the next uh, this month's virtual Narcan training. This is something that the opioid prevention and response teams does on a monthly basis. Uh, it's there are still openings available and people I encourage anybody who's interested uh, to visit the New Paltz Opioid Overdose Prevention and Response Team website and they can register for the training there. Um, I just want to give a thank you to Ulster County uh, Community College. Um, we had uh, there was CIT graduation, the crisis intervention team training graduation uh, last week. Uh, Ulster County was gracious enough to allow the, um, the class to meet there. Uh, it was the largest class of CIT trainees so far, I think 44 in total and included dispatchers um, from uh, Ulster County 911 and one of our uh, full-time dispatchers as well. Um, and uh, this is something that you know, we're hoping we can continue with there um, given the interest in this particular training. Um, and so uh, just a you know, real big thank you to them. Chris Dennehy at Step One um, for uh, being one of the instructors and, and, and a huge asset for us in terms of uh, doing our mental health in service and uh, People USA. And then the last announcement I have is that um, we will be opening up the registration for our Citizens Police Academy on June 21st. Um, it'll run from oct excuse me from September 8th every Wednesday from September 8th through October 27th. Um, there's a little bit of uh, information on the website currently. We will uh, have the form for the registration on there as well. And um, I look to, uh, my hope is to present a little bit more information to everyone at next month's police commission meeting in terms of curriculum, what we're looking to do with that. And that's all I have for announcements. Great. And um, any, any other announcements? If not, I would like to uh, open the floor for public input. Um, raise your digital hand. I cannot see your face. You can, uh, if you're calling in, you can raise your digital hand by pressing star nine. Um, or, <clears throat> and please limit your comments to three minutes. And I'm gonna be a little bit uh, stricter with that. <clears throat> Some people have been taking advantage of. Edgar. Uh, good evening. Um, I type my comments. I could be efficient with it. It's short. <clears throat> At a late night uh, town board meeting a few meetings ago, a board member recommended that I and others supplement our public uh, input comments with related with related emails to your board because this could save time for everyone. I agree, and I sent an email on behalf of our New Paltz Coalition on Safety and Wellbeing to the board and police chief about tonight's agenda published on Tuesday. The next day, Wednesday, David Brownstein provided a lengthy uh, response speaking as one board member. David, I appreciate the process and the quickness with, with which you, which is great for the public participation and contributes to the dialogue the community seeks to increase. Uh, we, are, we are learning in detail how you operate as a board and what we call Civics 101 course on how the town board functions in decision making. Tonight, I hope that the board as a whole affirms David's observations and his email response on the first three of 24 steering uh, committee police reform items that you are addressing. 
apparently over an extended period that I hope ends before your next budget process that starts in August, because I wonder if there are any implications for the budget. Uh, one, on demographic data, the board made a request, at, this is at the last meeting, to the police chief and the chief agreed. But what is unclear is the timetable for the chief. Uh, did I hear that it may uh, be as long as six months to do the, uh, the, uh, the, the demographic data uh, that's needed? And two, on the chokehold policy, did I understand, David, that no change will be made to the policy outside of some definitions to be included in the actual policy? And finally, uh, number three, um, is about the new police commission. I understand that you're awaiting a response from the Association of Towns about possible commission models. And, uh, and, and, the hope, and, and we hope that uh, you have some feedback for us tonight. Um, and um, and, if you, and about whether you have any new information on possible models for the new police commission. Thank you. Uh, Tom? You're muted, Tom. Keep asking him to unmute. It seem to be working. Yeah, I just did it as well, too. I'm not sure what's going on there. Huh. There you go, Tom. Oh, OK. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to read, too. Um, I'd like to um, comment on the NPPRRC recommendation regarding misuse of force. I quote, the NPPD develop a practice of decrying misuse of force incidents anywhere in clear language and articulate how this department avoids similar acts through training policy and ethical commitments. Um, the NPPD policy and regulation webpage contains a 15 page policy on officer defensive action, meaning use of force. While this policy would arguably be the keystone in any effort to prevent the worst types of police violence against citizens, uh, the Reform Commission co Coalition, unfortunately, did not provide any real analysis of it. In my admittedly brief review, I could confirm that the current policy includes many of the common sense elements recommended by the Police Use of Force Project. However, three limitations uh, did not appear, uh, do not appear to be included in, in the current policy. The first um, is failing to require officers to intervene and stop excessive force used by other officers and report these incidents immediately to a supervisor. Um, in this connection, the chief and the police commission should also consider whether New Paltz should join the city of Buffalo in adopting what has been called Carriol's Law, which enshrines these requirements and associated penalties and law. This was the case in Buffalo where a woman was, a police officer was fired for intervening in, in a case of, of, of uh, misuse of force. Uh, she was ultimately reinstated and this law uh, protects the status of people who intervene in that way. Uh, the current policy 14.1 uh, rules of conduct section 30 only states employees shall not interfere with cases being handled by other employees of the department or by any other governmental agency unless a ordered to intervene by a superior employee or b the intervening employee believes beyond a reasonable doubt that a manifest injustice would result from failure to take immediate action. That B is not an obligation of the employee to intervene. It is only if the employee should have the incredible courage to do so, um, they have to uh, establish beyond a reasonable doubt, et cetera. So I think that's a, a weak statement of, of what needs to be there. Uh, the second item that's missing from our use of force currently is a failure to develop a force continuum that limits the types of force and or weapons that can be used to respond to specific types of resistance. And third, failing to require officers to exhaust all other reasonable means before resorting to deadly force. Um, as part of your review of this recommendation, please ask the chief to explain how the reporting requirements, investigative procedures and penalties in case of infractions are handled in actual practice to assure complete and consistent execution. Um, Neil, have I got any time left? Uh, one second. <laughs> um, I can't go over a little bit. 
um, we're, we're we're directed that we need to be uniform in our enforcement because right. then we gonna, get accused gonna, of favoritism. So no, no, that's fine. Um, I'm going to include my uh, my my complete comments in uh, in the record to the. Uh, yeah, if you could the write them down, that would be super helpful. Okay, and send, and send them in. Thank you. Uh, Maggie. Supervisor, could I just respond, please? And I know we don't normally do that, but I'm concerned that misinformation is being propagated here um, sure. to the public. And I want to address a couple of Tom's points. The first, Tom, if you read on page 12, letter small i, paragraph three, if an officer observes another member of the agency using force that is clearly beyond that which is objectively reasonable under the circumstances, shall, when it is a position to do so safely, intercede to prevent the use of excessive force. Officers shall report their observations, actions to their supervisor. If no supervisor is working, notification will be made to the next scheduled supervisor. We have a duty to intervene in our policy. I see. And, and where is that? Page, tw page 12 of the policy. There is a duty to intervene in the policy. Okay, I, in I, terms I, of a use of, I just, I'm going to comment. I don't really want to try to avoid the back and forth, but I don't want people in the public to think that your information is correct. The other part is that we, our policy is based on an objectively reasonable. Um, the, 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 uh, the use of force um, continuum that you were referring to is, is, a, is a philosophy in terms of use of force. Ours is more aligned with what Herp teaches, which is critical, in, critical decision making, which is like a, it, really a loop of thinking that we want the officers to take into account. Um, and so that's more of a philosophy, not necessarily something you would put into policy and it's reflected in the training itself. So I just want the board to understand that so that they under, so they know that these things are within our policy and that they're not missing. So thank you. All right, uh, Maggie. Um, okay, hi, uh, good evening. Um, first, I wanna make a kudos to to Scott Butler, he made a really wonderful presentation at a meeting that the women who do research, a group at, um, at the Reformed Church. And it was very, very informative. Um, it demonstrated a lot of empathy and, and, um, um, and concern for, uh, for the public. And, you know, I like to say that publicly because of course you hear me complaining about some things that I, uh, and I really wanna um, present as, uh, as a person who tries to be as objective as possible. But more importantly, um, it was just very informative. So um, that was something that was helpful. And I also want to comment that I was at the meeting the other day at, um, at Water Street Market. And um, I asked the question about, um, about the, uh, an idea of what the police would be thinking about when um, there is a proposal to put, um, to decriminalize all drugs. And that process would, would need to be questioned. But um, I thought that it was just something that I'd like to present here, simply because it's something that I'd like to think that years and years ago, when we talked about decriminalizing marijuana because of the negative impact that it had on those who were picked up for use and, and um, that this town and the police department really begin a dialogue with the community about what they think about that. Um, because there is a legislation that was introduced by Corey Bush, Representative Corey Bush, to decriminalize um, all drugs. And I think that it goes to um, the point that there are other countries, there are other places that really um, do a much better job of trying to address the medical needs of people who abuse drugs. And, um, and I know that you've done a resolution for the New York Health Act um, and you support resolutions related to um, things that matter to our health. And I think that this is a thing that does matter to our health. Um, that's my first comment. My, my second comment is um, that I'm, I'm wondering, we talked a lot about trying to get data onto the website and I know that's beginning to be developed by, um, by the department and that's much appreciated. I guess I want to really specifically ask what's happening with the right to know and where, where is that? Have they gotten their, um, their cards? I guess they have to have ID cards that they can present to people when they get stopped and don't give them a ticket. And I also remember that I had suggested that it be for any stop, not for whether they get a ticket or not, because then um, we'd have a more robust picture 
of what uh, what stops are being made and how um, legitimate or not legitimate, but just um, add to the database that we really want to keep. Um, so, and then finally, I wanted to add that I'm really happy that- um, that that's, three, the, that's three minutes, you could wrap it up. I, I'm happy that you're doing the commission work outside of the internal work that you were hoping to do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, any, other, any other comments? If going once, going twice, uh, if there are no more comments. We will move on to the, uh, the first item on the agenda. And I guess that is to go into executive session to discuss personnel. And I would like to invite the chief in with us and we will uh, stop the recording and put everyone in the waiting room and then we'll be back. Um, so do a motion to go into executive session and invite the chief. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right, okay, I am going to uh, pause the recording and um, if you guys can, <clears throat> I've uh, restarted the recording. It is now uh, 7.01 and I'm about to admit everyone back in to the meeting. <clears throat> so I have uh, restarted the recording and uh, everyone is back in and I would like to make a motion to come out of executive session. Uh, no action being taken. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, um, and uh, Chief, I'd like to, we're gonna uh, review a request to approve appointing a part-time officer, Kaylin Marsh, to a 90 degree temporary full-time position. Yes, thank you, Supervisor. So um, Officer Michelle Yeager is uh, going to uh, serve us a, a letter of resignation. She's gonna be taking a job uh, effective June 23rd with the uh, uh, town of Carmel Police Department. Um, and so with that, we're down, uh, at that point, we're down four full-time bodies, uh, in patrol. Um, so what I'm looking for is approval to appoint, uh, part-time officer Kaylin Marsh, uh, to a 90 day temporary full-time position, uh, per civil service. That's the maximum that we can do And the effective dates would be July 11th through October 11th, um, Losing Jaeger uh, would put us down to only uh, two full-time members on the C line, which is one of our busier shifts. Um, so uh, it would uh, it would help us uh, in in uh, in doing that. Um, you know, losing Michelle is tough. Um, she's been a phenomenal officer, and uh, um, but uh, Kaylin has been doing great work. And uh, I, I, you know, somebody who can you know come in seamlessly and, and do the job on a full-time basis. Make a motion to refer to the town board. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, and um, so number three is a review and discussion of revised policy uh, 121.0, uh, search warrants and 47.5, impaired and intoxicated driving. I <clears throat> hand it over to you, Chief. Thank you. So the revisions made to the search warrant were really to align with our current practices as well as what's, you know, um, what's being uh, uh, the legislative efforts being made, uh, not just at the New York State, but nationwide in terms of no knock, the use of no knock search warrants. So as an agency, we, we stopped using or employing no knock or what we call dynamic entry uh, search warrants for um, non life threatening situations back in 2019. Um, when uh, the legislation for uh, when it appeared that um, there was a change in legislation as far as bail and discovery, you know, these are when you talk about no knock and dynamic entry search warrants, you're talking about warrants that have uh, that pose a significant potential for uh, the use of deadly physical force. And so, um, you know, for us, we did not feel that this was um, aligned with our philosophy in terms of you know, where we were moving as an agency with drugs and, and treating it more like an illness than, than, than a criminal matter. Um, and so we had stopped doing that. And um, as a matter of fact, Lieutenant and I had a meeting in 2019 with the sheriff and others just to talk about that and how those, you know, whether those warrants, those types of warrants were being employed. So the, the corrections or the, the, the changes to our policy relate to that. Um, specifically, there's a section in on uh, page three uh, related to the no knock, just saying that they shall be limited to specific extreme cases of imminent threat to human life, 
including the investigation and or pursuing of suspected offenses or offenders that involve murder, an active shooter, hostage taking, kidnapping, uh, things like that. We, we don't want to be using them um, for anything other than, you know, threat to imminent threat to life. Um, you know, and it doesn't preclude us from doing a search warrant, but the idea is that when you are any other warrant would be, you know, a knock, announce, wait, and then, you know, make entry. Um, but we would, you know, we would not, uh, for anything other than those situations, that's, that would, would be where we were, uh, how we would operate with those. Um, so those were the changes in, the, in that particular policy. This policy, except for one section pertaining to the notification, which we did not want to publish because potentially it poses a, a safety risk to officers and their response should be out there, is on our website as well. Um, with these, and, you know, I, I send it to you for your review. Um, I, I don't, I wasn't necessarily, uh, see, you know, looking for approval or, 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 or passage, but if there's any questions, concerns, or anything that you think that we should be re, you know, re-examining, I certainly want to, you know, uh, have that in there as well. I don't know if there's any questions about the search warrant policy. Okay. Um, policy 47 point, oh, sorry. Policy yeah, just, 47. Just this, oh, sorry. This is this is this is this is David. I, I think both I think both of your changes seem warranted and appropriate. And um, I appreciate you clarifying that um, this situation. Not you know, uh, our approval is not 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 being asked, but our our um, our input is being asked. So thank thank you for that clarification. Thank you, sir. Um, the uh, the other policy is the impaired and intoxicated driving policy, and the changes made here were really to reflect bail reform, raise the age, and, and the uh, the legalization of uh, recreational marijuana, and it relates directly to our processing, holding, and uh, on the individuals that we um, arrest for DWI or DWAI drugs. Um, and, and then um, how we would utilize a drug recognition expert, uh, because currently there is no roadside, uh, there is no roadside uh, test like there is a PBT for alcohol. There's nothing like that for marijuana. So um, really this was to make sure that the procedures uh, for the officers to adhere to with, the, with uh, 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 getting a DRE and um, administering um, the, uh, the DWAI uh, drug tests are, 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 are clear to them and how we would potentially charge. Um, and then the uh, other part of this relates to, um, you know, holding of an individual the, and, and what we would do, you know, how we would do that because you no longer arraign for refusals on DWIs. Um, so we needed to make some changes related to that as well. Um, and just how we would go about, um, in essence, just having a, you know, a defendant could sit in our lobby and we just want to make sure that those were clear to our officers. Um, but th those were the changes and, and the reason for those changes. I don't know if there's any questions on that one. No, and again, this, I'm sorry, this policy is online as well, is on our website as well. And will I do have a question? It's Julie. Um, will the public be made aware of what to expect in a DWAI, uh, you know, inquiry? Um, I, I don't know if the. I mean, the policy is there, so they be able to read exactly how we proceed and process an individual. Um, you know, normally the way you handle a DWI is, you know, it begins with, you know, a vehicle and traffic stop for an offense, whatever that offense may be. And then if there's reasonable suspicion that the operator is intoxicated, then the officer would have that person conduct um, field sobriety tests. And then based upon the performance of those field sobriety tests, the, you know, the officer makes a determination whether that, uh, that individual's ability has been impaired by alcohol and or drugs. Um, in New York State, it's a privilege to operate a motor vehicle. So in essence, when you sign for your driver's license, you are consenting to a test for drugs and or alcohol. Um, and so uh, if, if uh, based upon the performance of those tests, we would arrest somebody, we, you know, we would establish, if, could, that's how you would establish a probable cause to make that arrest for DWI. And then they're brought back to the station where they're put on a, um, a data master for alcohol. 
Um, and then depending upon the results of that, we may be subsequently testing for uh, impairment by drugs. And that's where a drug recognition expert would come in to play. So what, that's what I was wondering about since, you know, I think people know what to expect. Let's say you're a passenger, you know, when people, so people know what to expect when someone's suspected of drinking alcohol, you know, there could be a breathalyzer or there could be walking, dancing, right? <laughs> um, no, I'm joking, but the, there, you know, could be walking a line, whatever. We have sort of like a general idea. And since you said there's, this is a new policy for, you know, because of the legalization of recreational marijuana, that's what I'm curious about. I'm curious so if, and, and I'm curious myself, you know, if there's, if the test um, itself will be sort of available, you know, made the, the, how, how the test would go um, would be made available. Well, like, no, is it there, legal? There is um, no test. Sorry. There, there is no, there is no test. So, the, so what, I mean, the, I know it's not a breathalyzer type test, but is there something like that, it, that a person, let's say a passenger would expect their, the, the person who's driving to be subjected to in the, in, you know, right at the car there? Well, that, that, that that's what I'm, so two things. This isn't a new, a new policy, Julie. This is a, an old policy. Really what we, what we changed in here was just um, making sure we um, had properly documented the procedure of when you want to call a DRE because we anticipate the need for those uh, more often um, a, as we move forward. Um, you know, the, the, the roadside tests are, are the same and, and that's the, that starts it out. And then depending upon, you know, the performance of those tests, any other, and any information gleaned at the time of the stop, um, that would kind of dictate how we would move forward. So if, you know, there's probable cause to make the arrest because we believe the individual's ability has been impaired, we would uh, take them into custody, advise them the Miranda warnings, the DWI warnings, and we would ask them to submit to a chemical test of their breath for alcohol. Um, if, you know, if it, that test, you know, reads out zeros and, you know, based upon the performance, then it would lead us to believe that their ability has been impaired by drugs. So the only test that is, you know, we would have a DRE come in to confirm that and that there are tests that they perform. I don't know what they are, but a DRE is a, is a especially trained officer who um, is, is, and based upon their test, they're able to determine more about the impairment by drugs. Um, and ultimately, if that's the case, then we would bring that individual um, to the hospital for a uh, for blood, and that's what they would test for the presence of drugs in the system. Oh, okay. And so, um, thank you. So the this the DRE is it? Um, they would be in the at the station rather than on the at at the car, for example, or on the street. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you would have, I mean, best, the best is to have them available, but there are not a lot of DREs. I think there's only two DREs in all of Ulster County right now. Um, the DRE training is extensive. It uh, starts out, you have to be certified um, in, uh, as a field, in field sobriety testing, and then um, they have to be certified in A-RIDE, which is a recognition uh, of, of drug and impairments. Um, and then ultimately you go to uh, training for DRE, which is a, um, it's a month of in-school. Um, then there's actually a month practical work where they'll, depending upon, um, they've done it in, they'll, they'll go out of state where they'll spend a month doing running tests on people for roadside. Um, and then ultimately, you know, they receive their certification, but there's only two DREs in all of Ulster County, I think at this time, two or three. Talk about job okay, security. I, I, I'll explain, I guess, why I was curious is just because I, I feel like a, a, you know, informed populace is, you know, better off. We're, we're all better off. So, so that someone isn't upset by the treatment that they're seeing, right, happen. Does that make sense? No, because it does. I mean, because I, they know it's appropriate. So I don't, I just still don't know, you know, but you said it's, so it's a breathalyzer even if it's suspect, suspected of marijuana, um, and well, yes, and then well, you're basically mm -hmm. you're making the the initial arrest is based upon 
so you have reasonable suspicion that you, you have probable cause to stop a vehicle. Let's, for whatever reason, yeah, you, there's a violation of the vehicle traffic law. That's your probable cause to stop the vehicle. You begin to speak, the, speak to the operator. You um, detect the odor of an alcoholic beverage emanating. Um, you detect the odor of marijuana, which is the only legal way. If you said at this point, that's the only legal um, uh the odor of marijuana is provide reasonable suspicion when it comes to the operation of a motor vehicle. It's the only time um, the odor of marijuana. But you bring that individual out of the car, you ask them to perform field sobriety tests, and there's a variety of tests. You're making notes of that, their performance. And then based upon that performance, you would make a determination if their ability to operate the motor vehicle has been impaired. They're taken into custody. They're provided their Miranda warnings, the DWI warnings. And then uh, they are afforded the opportunity to take a chemical test at the station of their breath for alcohol. If they refuse, then their license is immediately suspended. Um, if they take the test, depending upon how the test, you know, if they're over the legal limit of 0.08, then they're processed, released on the tickets, and uh, they return to court on a later date. If for whatever reason, uh, you know, they blow zeros in the data master on the chemical test, then um, we would contact a drug recognition expert to come in to test, to, to conduct their tests, which again, I don't necessarily know the specifics of those tests. And based upon that, we would then look to uh, take that individual to the area hospital for blood. Uh, again, they would be processed, released on tickets and sent on their way to a period of court at a later date and time. Okay, thank you. I just I and all that and all that's all that's in this policy. Right, right. I'm. I just hope it's understood what I'm. What I was getting at, where I just I look for I I you know hope that we can find ways to re to reduce um, conflicts in the field. And uh, all I needed to hear about is what what would be observed per perhaps by a friend, you know, in the field, as far as um, what you know, how, what they're doing. And it sounds like it's just sobriety and that's, that's all I was interested in. Okay. So that so sobriety tests are the same. That's, that's all. It wasn't the whole process that I was curious about just because you, you know what I'm saying? Just so that people, there's a lot of people that want to film because they feel like there's something going wrong, for example. And then, you know, there can be just tensions rise, right. Cause they're not familiar with it, but I didn't realize that there wasn't something. I thought you were saying there was something new and different for this well, because of the change of, of legality. And I just thought we could be educated about it, but it's just, you know, it sounds well, the like- Well, the change that has to do with us and, and, and having, um, you know, making sure we have the DRE coming in and, and at what point and the proper procedure for contacting the DRE. That's really where this, this comes from. And that's the highlighted, uh, there, there was a highlighted section. I think it's on page 10 of that. You, yeah, you bet, thank that. you. Thanks. I just thought there was something yep. I was I was missing, and I thank you very much. Great. Um, any more questions? Uh, we can move on to number four: the update on the IPVI program rollout. And again, over to you, Chief. So um, you know, so far the uh, we rolled out our IPVI program, the Intimate Partner Violence Intervention Program, uh, on May seventeenth. Um, and since then, um, we've actually uh, classified nine um, IPVI offenders, um, and these are individuals that had been identified as primary aggressors in the, during the domestic dispute and uh, uh, were arrested and or charged. So um, when we do that and make that classification, we're making notification to Crime Victims Assistance Program for follow-up with the victim. We're making notification to the district attorney's office. Uh, we make notification to... Um, uh, family of Woodstock in terms of trying for intervention programs um, to try and uh, stem the, the issues or, you know, resolve the issues that are maybe the underlying issues that are causing these. Um, I, I think, you know, so far it, it's been going well. Uh, we conduct biweekly calls with uh, the IPVI partners and the uh, national network, which is in charge of that. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think the program has is, is, been well received by the officers as well. I just wanted to give a quick update on that. Okay, thanks. And um, <clears throat> the um, number five is the uh, um, MPPRRC report recommendations review. So again, uh, Chief. 
<clears throat> Chief, before you start that, um, yep. uh, Supervisor, if, if we might, just, just um, for clarification of the note that I sent, I thought we'd put that on the record, um, just, uh, just to be clear, uh, and Chief, just to the best of your recollection, recollection, or we can go back to the minutes of the last police chief, uh, the uh, um, police commission meeting, um, there is no change to the chokehold policy as it exists on our books. Uh, and the, we made no change to that policy. And so there's no vote being taken on any change there because there is no change. Um, as far as the police commission issue, we just got information yesterday and you'll just got a, got a one, you know, a whole bunch of information on um, uh, uh, possible police commit citizens police commission um, um, information and we're going to be reviewing that and we'll have something for the next meeting on that that's our intention and as far as the the data collection chief do you remember what we had asked for and what we had agreed to uh, that you can just review here or if you don't we'll just go back to the record and, and check that September. I will be presenting you on September at the September Police Commission meeting. I will be presenting you with the data that we had collected from September of 2019 through, I'm sorry, September of 2020 through September of 2021, September 1st, 2021. Great. So we'll have the first year, year of data at our September meeting. And just to clarify to one of the points that was made questioning about whether we're going to get through these recommendations by the time we're considering the budget, I think it's fair to say we're not going to get through all of these recommendations because we're going to take them slowly and carefully. And um, so we're going to move at the speed of trust here and move, move slowly through them. Um, um, and we'll deal with our budget when it's time to time to consider the budget. That's my, my view anyway. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree, David. I, I want to do it right. I, I don't want to do it fast. Um, and uh, I did send the, that um, the information, the links around to a lot of information. Uh, the, the attorneys for AOT Association of Towns was very helpful. <clears throat> I think they provided a lot. Um, I mean, I started going through it and the first thing I downloaded was like a 30 page document um, from the Albany Law Center uh, going into the background for all of this. A nice review. I encourage everyone to read that one first. It kind of sets it up nice. I can highlight which link that was, but it's a, it's a good article um, and it kind of sets it in the whole context of when the citizens boards were you know, first started, you know, at, people were pushing for these as early as the 20s and 30s. Um, and then it kind of rises and falls over time. Big push was made in the 60s. Um, and then <clears throat> they, it, it's kind of grown ever since then. So it's, it's interesting to read and it explains the different types, class one, two, three, four, five. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a nice background. I encourage everyone to read it. Maybe we can have a discussion about that. Um, so uh, sorry to talk too long. Over to you, Chief. No, no problem. Um, so the uh, recommendation from the uh, Reform and Reinvention Committee was that all New Paltz government employees, New Paltz Town Board, Village Board of New Paltz, and all entities under these jurisdictions and the town justices receive training in undoing racism presented by the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. It is also recommended that an in-service training be instituted annually as a refresher course and to capture any new hires by the same presenters. Um, and I you know, cited Peter Heyman, Tracy Gibbons Hunter uh, as, the, as the trainers. Um, so, you know, we have begun to research this. Uh, I have. Um, it's actually something I had looked to try to attend last year. Um, and the class I had registered for was canceled just due to COVID. Um, you know, this will, when we talk about budget, this will certainly be uh, a significant addition to our budget. I think the, the cost for the class in and of itself is going to, um, run anywhere from ten to twenty thousand um, dollars, and then we will be, you know, have to figure out um, how we, uh, what the staffing costs will be, because we're going to have to run in the bare bones minimum two sessions in order to get all of our all of our officers um, certified and or to attend this this training. Um, it, it is, you know, it is something I will include in my twenty twenty budget proposal. Absolutely, that's that's my plan, um, and. Uh, um, you know, as far as you know, the town board, the village board, or anybody else wanting to work and try to, you know, maybe grouping together to try to minimize the, the, the costs, um, you know, to one particular agency or department, we could, you know, I, I don't know if that's something the town board wants to look at with the village and school district and whatnot, but 
you know, it's something we're going to, you know, I'm, I am going to include in my 2022 budget. I mean, we have no control over um, any of these other entities, this, the school. Um, I, I, we can ask if the village included this in their budget this year. Um, that would, you know, help us, you know, if the village included it in their budget, you know, we could make a bigger push to put it into our budget for next year and do it in the spring. Um, the judges, we have no control over what the judges do or don't do. I can't even get them to come to a department head meeting. So, um, or even their, their employees to come to a department head meeting. We've been told we're not allowed to, to do that. It would be up to them if they want to do it. Um, but I think the first step is exactly like you say, let's figure out what the cost is and then we can decide. And so that will be part of what we talk about for the budget this year. So I think that's a good, a good approach. Um, and then, so the no, B chief, is that all you had to say about A? That's all I had to say about the recommendations on the uh, undoing racism. Yep. Um, as, the, as the liaison from the village board, I'm happy to check on whether or not it's in our budget and to work with you on seeing if we can reach out and find ways to, um, if we can come together to make it more affordable. Thanks. This was, I, I was at this training a couple of years ago. This was a two day training. If I, if I remember correctly, chief, is that what you remember too? It's a two day. Yeah, it's two full day training. Um, so it's, it's, a, it can be substantial in cost, but it was, it was really effective. Um, and uh, when I attended the Kingston police um, were, were, were represented there fairly well. And um, it was nice to have them uh, as part of that discussion. All right, um, <clears throat> this um, uh, B chief, the, uh, the recommendation to um, uh, decrying misuse of force incidents. Uh, so Cream. the recommendation is that the, we develop a practice of decrying uh, misuse of force incidents anywhere in clear language and articulate how this department avoids similar acts of training policy and ethical commitments. Um, you know, I, I, in terms of, you know, decrying incidences, you know, I, I you know, I think that that's not always possible. You know, we will do when we can. I mean, you know, I, I personally responded in the wake of George Floyd's murder. The, the department did, the officers did uh, put out a statement related to that as well. Um, you know, one of the things that we are really focused on though is looking at incidences that occur and how we can prevent them from happening here. Um, and we really focus on those as, as lessons for tra in, in training lessons. Um, I think I mentioned this at the last meeting um, when we talk about um, when we talk about the death of Daniel Prude in the city of Rochester. Um, you know that was part of our fall training curriculum, um, and and the focus that you know we put on the officers and the, and the instruction that we had in the office that we want to limit this when we're dealing with a, a situation like that. You want to limit the struggle. You want to limit the time that the individual is on the ground, and you want to limit the time that medical assistance before they get medical assistance. Um, and I think this is something that even Maggie had kind of uh, alluded to uh, in the public comment last, last month. And, and those are the things that we are doing. Um, when, um, again, you know, it happened in the city of Rochester, it was the pepper spraying of the, the nine-year-old girl out there. Um, two of our instructors, the two, uh, Joe Judge, uh, our defense and tactics instructor, and Phil Krause, our crisis intervention mental health instructor, actually came to the lieutenant and said, listen, we want to put out um, uh, a, uh, a training uh, briefing on this um, to all members. It included the videos from the body cameras that the officers are wearing, and then specifically citing things that we've gone over in our training um, and that, you know, had they been employed in that, it may have um, prevented that, you know, the outcome there. Um, and so we are always looking at those, uh, any opportunity. Um, I don't believe training is a one and done sort of thing and it has to be continuous. It has to be continuous reinforcement. And um, so we, we, we definitely look at these opportunities. We may miss something and we may not, you know, at, at times, but we're, you know, we're going to continue to show you the best thing that we, the best that we can um, to examine these incidences and, and try um, to uh, create lesson and training to avoid, you know, that happening here. Um, and I, and I do think you know we would take these on a case by case basis. 
So Chief, I really like the, um, I, I like the learning from other people's um, missteps or mistakes. I, I, I really like what, uh, um, what Sergeant Butler, or Lieutenant Butler did um, by looking at the examples in Rochester. Um, I, I think it, you know, those real world examples, I think actually are when you really learn a lot um, because it's not just some hypothetical, it's, you know, your peers and, you know, you learn from their mistakes and it's the real world. And so I, I think that's a really good practice. And, and I think there are times when, yes, like George Floyd, everyone needs to take a stand. I, I'm less comfortable with us, like reading through every single newspaper and, uh, you know, issuing a press release every time we think someone did something wrong because we don't know all the facts. Right, it's like people on, on social media commenting on stuff. And I, and I think until you know all the facts, I, I don't think it's good to weigh in. Um, so I'm not comfortable. I think we can do it on a case by case basis, but that's just me. I think, um, you know, unless we, we're involved in, and we know the facts, uh, I'm, I'm less comfortable with us, you know, issuing press releases every single time we read something in the paper somewhere. Um, that's just my own opinion, you know put it out there for the rest of the board. Uh, a lot of times these things are complicated and you don't know the whole story unless you're involved in the case, you know. Yeah, uh, if I could make a comment, I, I, I guess I would suggest Chief, and I think you do this pretty well already, um, is, uh, you know, highlighting those trainings that where you are working on those. I, mean, I think that's a way of decreeing those things is saying, this is, this is kind of the facts or this is the situation as we understand it happened in Rochester. This is, our, this is our response. This is how we're using it to train our officers and how we want to respond. And when you do that in a public setting, like at a meeting like this, as part of your police report, you're saying what is not acceptable that we're making sure that we have straight as a department. And um, it's also a great opportunity uh, for Lieutenant Butler to come as he does, I, I know he leads a fair amount of training and to kind of like be in front of the board and um, or the police commission and say, here's what we just did. It's great. and. Um, and, and here's how we're responding to some things that are happening in the world and making sure that they're not happening here. So just continuing to make that, make, make what you're doing public more and more. I think we, we run an excellent agency and uh, uh, let, it, let people know how, how we do such a good job. And when we're not doing such a good job, which you're also doing, you, you know, thank you. We're trying and, 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 and we're taking it, you know, a step at a time. I mean, yeah, I, I'm going to review it anyway next month, but you know, even our training, our, our, our we just completed, or we will be completing um, our spring firearms defensive tactics cycle training. You know, one of the things that, you know, we focused on in particular in this training were tasers and the use and the deployment and the drawing of tasers. And that was really a direct result of what, um, you know, we saw in Minnesota uh, with the officer who uh, shot uh, thinking they, she had drawn her taser. And so, you know, we want um, to make sure that, you know, we're not not addressing those things and, and that to make sure that we're preventing something like that from happening here. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And I, and I will try to continue to make more and more public what we are doing out there. And uh, so the third, um, the... Um... <clears throat> Uh, refraining and uh, contradicting statements. Um, so this was that as an agency, the refrain from contradicting statements, blue lives matter. Uh, is there a such so thing as a blue life? Uh, there's a uniform, which is worn by choice, while BIPOC are often deprived of choices through historic and uh, current norms of policing. This includes visual speech, such as flags and garments. Um, you know, off duty, um, you know, obviously some of that is, you know, our ability to, um, to address those or address that is somewhat limited. Um, you know, what I can say, and I've said it publicly, I think, you know, it, it's a, you know, when we talk about the uh, Blue Lives Matter, it's a false equivalency, not that I, I, I don't care about police lives, but I, you know, I do think that, you know, that, that I can comfortable saying that it's, it's, a, it's a false equivalency, but in terms of us and on duty, um, you know, our personnel are, it is, it, there are things that are, uh, you know, our, our policies um, prescribe what officers can and cannot uh, adorn on their uniforms um, in terms of garments, patches or whatnot. Um, you know, and I'll just use an example, you know, during the pandemic, um, you know, our members were told you either are wearing an N95 mask or you're wearing a blue surgical mask or you're wearing one of the masks that we bought 
that says MPPD on it. It was a you know holiday gift. It was uh, some people really like them, but um, you know that was it. And that's that's kind of you know that that's been our approach to all of this. Um, you know, in terms of um, freedom of expression and speech and and things like that. You know, they're off duty. It becomes a, a, a you know a slightly different issue for us, and and we'd have to look at those on a case by case basis. Uh, certainly, if somebody is in violation of the policy uh, on or off duty, it's something that we're going to address and not, you know, not hesitate to address. Okay, great. Um, any, uh, any comments? And if not, I will hand it over to you again, Chief, for the uh, monthly report. Okay, so um, I'll move forward here. I just want to see where I have some couple of quick notes. Um, all right, so I guess I'm going to start here uh, with the uh, a letter of accommodation. We had one letter of accommodation uh, for the month. Uh, no complaints, but uh, one letter of accommodation. And just so you know, I, I apologize. You know, I, I'm, we, I, I feel, I, I know I'm going to jinx myself and say we haven't had any complaints. So that's why we haven't talked about any complaints at any of these meetings. And I'm knocking on wood and knocking on my head. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, you know, so just in case any, there are any questions as to why we haven't discussed any of that. Um, we received a letter of commendation and this was for officers Krauss uh, and Halstead and Sergeant Lewis, um, a, uh, uh, a resident here um, has an elderly neighbor um, and uh, they went to check on her because they had not seen her uh, in a couple of days. Um, and, uh, they became concerned when she didn't answer the door, they called us officers responded. Um, they, uh, they had a key to the inside door, but not a storm door that was locked. The officers were able to force, uh, entry through that storm door and then use the key to get in. They actually located the, uh, the resident who was conscious, um, but, uh, had been on the floor, we think for a few days, uh, clearly dehydrated, um, and really in bad shape. Um, and so this was just thanking the officers, uh, for their profession, and, uh, their professional conduct and, and just their caring manner and their response. Um, the only thing I would say, um, and I, that the, the person who wrote this letter is actually should be commended as well. Um, their vigilance is what, saved, I think, this person's life. Um, they're still in a hospital, uh, to my understanding, uh, in, in rehabilitation, in rehab, um, physical rehab. Uh, but, uh, you know, I appreciate their trusting us and contacting us and calling us, but, and, and even the letter, but um, they, they truly uh, uh, help save this individual as well. So that is our, uh, our, our one letter of commendation for the month. Uh, we have, uh, couple uh, we have uh, two incidences involving defensive action uh, for the first incident there were report there were four reports filed um, this uh, first incident uh, the, the one person involved in this uh, was a 41 year old white male approximately six feet tall 260 pounds uh, large build uh, in this particular incident um, officers uh, had uh, we had received a complaint for an erratic operation of a motor vehicle um, and uh, officers located this vehicle uh, down in the village and then proceeded to try and stop the vehicle. Uh, the vehicle actually uh, ran several stop signs, almost hit another, uh, almost hit a pedestrian um, and, uh, um, and then also a, a work vehicle, but um, led our officers on a, uh, on a low speed uh, pursuit uh, that ended in uh, the town of Blackboard. So one of the defensive actions was for a taser deployment. One officer actually deployed, uh, pulled and deployed their taser. Um, another officer had their uh, patrol rifle and their taser out. Uh, and then two other officers had their firearms out. Uh, we reviewed the in-car camera, the body cameras, the body worn cameras rela rela related to this incident as well. Uh, spoke with the officers. Um, in this particular case, uh, as I said, there were four different reports and all uh, the department, uh, we deem that all of the, uh, the actions taken by the four officers involved, that's why there's four reports, were in compliance with department policy. Um, what I will say though, is that one individual officer 
in, 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 the, in reviewing this. Uh, we thought that there were some actions that were not necessarily consistent with department training or best practices in terms of department training. Uh, in this particular case, the officer had deployed their taser without full, having fully transitioned from uh, a lethal force. In this case, it was a patrol rifle to their less lethal force, which is their taser. And so um, the principle that we're trying to uh, really hammer home is that no one is in a situation like that. You, it's, it's impossible to operate two weapon systems simultaneously without making a mistake or we don't believe uh, you know, it's, there's a high likelihood for a mistake when you're trying to operate two weapon systems in a stressful situation like that. Um, so employing both lethal and less lethal at the same time um, could result in a sympathetic hand motion, which then could result in the discharge of an unintentional discharge of a weapon. So in this particular case, the opposite was addressed with the officer. It's been documented in uh, uh, progressive training. Uh, and it was uh, addressed as far as remedial training out on the range and something we also iterated to all of our officers out on the range as well in this in this cycle. The fact that, you know, you must fully transition before you if you're going to employ a secondary weapon system. Um, and some of this happened in, in this particular case. This was the result of uh, the individual. Another, uh, one officer had tased this and uh, deployed their taser. Uh, it was ineffective but it, uh, it was effective enough that they were able to go hands-on. So the secondary officer um, hadn't fully transitioned and pulled their taser just as another form of less lethal cover. Um, and so that was the, the issue that we noted and, uh, and as I said, was corrected. I don't know if there's any questions on any of that. One question, Chief, is just the clarification yep. between what you're calling policy, right? Everyone acted within policy at that incident. All four reports said everyone acted within policy but one did not work within best practices. Can you just, so I, I think I know what that means, but for the public, um, no discipline, no anything, just a learning, that's a learning, uh, is that a learning item for the department only? Yeah, that would be, you know, for us, that's a training. The idea is that, you know, the, when we say it's within compliance with department policy, the idea is that the, you know, the use of force was having a weapon out, whether it be the, the, the patrol rifle or the taser, is, is, is in compliance with department's training and policy in terms of the situation that they had. But given the totality of the circumstances, that level of force was not um, uh, unreasonable. Um, but when we talk about good, better, best, and that's really our training philosophy is good, better, best. And just because something didn't turn out well, does it, or does it mean, or just because something did turn out well, excuse me, doesn't mean that you know, we were always following uh, best practices. So for us, it's really looking at good, better, best. And, and that is, you know, the situation that we had here. And like I said, that's why in, in compliance with department policy, but not, um, you know, but some of the actions were of a concern. So it's a training issue in this case. Clarity there. Any other questions on that one? Okay. <clears throat> Um, so for the next incident, um, this was uh, two, uh, this, two officers had uh, taken out their pepper spray. They did not use it. We have two uh, individuals involved in this case. Um, the first is a 24-year-old uh, black male, approximately 5 feet 11 inches tall, 190 pounds, medium build. The other individual involved in this is a 22-year-old white male, about 6 feet, 170 pounds, uh, this was a, an altercation that was occurring out on Main Street. Officers responded to a fight call. Uh, when they responded, there were uh, a group of individuals that were fighting. Uh, they took out their pepper spray um, and uh, attempted to disperse the crowd verbally, took out their pepper spray and threatened the use of the pepper spray if the individuals would not stop fighting. Um, the parties uh, disengaged with one another. Uh, they were able to separate them and then uh, investigate what the situation was. No arrests were made in this case and uh, no pepper spray was deployed, but the fact that they um, took out their canisters and threatened the use of that, um, uh, we, we, that's something we would wanna, uh, that for our policy, that's something you're going to file a report on. I don't know if there's any question on that one. Okay. Um, the only, uh, on the training report, the one thing that I just, I, I, I know I'm, I'm hammering at home, but is, you know, if you, one of the items that we did is uh, we send out a training video that was put on, uh, uh, that was created by the New York State Office of Mental Health, along with the New York State Police. It's a de-escalation training video. 
it was about a 15, 20 minute video. And um, so we put it out to members uh, as far as watching that video uh, with a quick debrief and then they sign off on that. Um, and that's kind of what we were talking about before, uh, just that it's an, uh, training is ongoing. It's, it, you know, our department is built on five pillars, as I like to say, people, policy, training, oversight, and discipline. And so, um, you know, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, it's not, again, just to check a box, but that training is a continuous part of what it is that we do out there. I don't, uh, there was nothing else on that particular um, training report that I had. And I think that was it for my monthly report, unless anybody has any questions. All right, thank you, Chief. And so the, <clears throat> the last item is uh, added kind of recently, but um, so we're getting, you know, as, as we discussed when we created these no parking areas, we're, we're starting to get requests from people to, um, to have temporary waivers of the no parking areas. And, um, you know, I know, uh, I think we, we discussed that we would consider doing this and I wanted to bring it up with the board. Um, and kind of make a proposal and see what the board thought. You know, I thought that, um, you know, this could be something like we, we've been doing with the, um, the filming contracts, but this could be, uh, you know, I would be authorized to, um, to approve these, but it would be based on input from the chief of police and the highway superintendent. And, um, you know, we could come up with some criteria um, you know, it, traffic volume, is it safe to allow parking there? There are some places there's a reason there's no parking, but there are other places where we just didn't want people parking there. So, you know, traffic volume, how long would it be? Are there other safety issues? Um, and then maybe, you know, we would have a you know, temporary signage, just like we allow uh, people to create temporarily, temporary no parking areas by putting up temporary signs. We could have the, uh, the person who's requesting this, um, they would have to buy some signs and it would be, you know, temporary parking allowed or something like that, um, just as a way. And we'd have a, we could set a time limit on it. And I just wanted to see what the, what the board thought of this. That makes a lot of sense to me, Neil. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me too, Neil. I okay. agree. Do you have examples of what, I mean, maybe movies you said? No, uh, I mean, yeah, it, it, there are times we get, we get asked, and we've done this in the past where, um, you know, there's been a, a film that's shooting and they need to park along the side of the road. And so we'll uh, allow parking um, there. Um, but this is also, you know, the most recent request came from someone where we have, uh, we've created a no parking area, but I think they're having some people over their house for some reason and they need people to be able to park on the road. And so they uh, sent an email or called and they said, well, how, you know, how would we be, how would we go about uh, getting parking allowed? you know, in the spot. And, and I, my preference is always to put in a um, kind of a, a policy and it's not done on a case by case basis. I'd rather follow the same procedure, you know, every single time. And, you know, maybe the procedure changes as we learn more, but also I think it's always good to start with a, a, a protocol. And, um, and so that, that's, you know, thinking about it, you know, that's, the, that's kind of what I came up with, but I wanted to run it by the board. Um, you know, we can, I can try to write something up and, um, and if the board can approve it, but I wanted to run it by you first if you, if you thought this was something worth pursuing. Neil, since it's law, I would imagine we would need to pass it by our attorney as well. Uh, I guess we could ask Joe how we would, you know, temporarily allow uh, parking in no parking areas. So it's a good point. And, and the criteria I think might matter, you know. I mean, I think one of the problems is we told people we would do this when we created no parking areas. Well, as long as we can. <laughs> yeah, I remember something a little different. Um, <laughs> I remember that what we said was um, for folk in, in no parking zones, you know, please call the police department if you're attending on having an event and there will be cars out front um, in that no parking zone so that you could be alerted and maybe people would put something on those windshields saying this we're, we're here at this residence. Um, and, and so the police would, would know that there's a party going on or something like that or an event going on and that we could control like, hey, you can only be on one side of the street. You can't be out, you can't be encroaching on the road on both sides. 
or things like that. So I just like to hear from the chief of like, what would you prefer in in this? Or and and Neil, does it start to get like, okay, you can put no parking zone, you know, signs up, and then you have someone's neighbor saying, why are they putting, you know, yes parking signs in front of my house? Um, I don't want them in front of my house, and then you're then you're going to get a bunch of complaints. So I'm a little concerned about. You know, how I'm, consistent that policy has to be. I'm, I'm bringing this up because these people asked the police and the police contacted me. You know, I think so it also us, might matter. Uh, I, I'll just say it, it might matter where, because if it's an issue of safety, obviously, then that's not going to work. So, I mean, uh, for, for the us, I, I'm just the reason I, I you know I, I defer to the board is just it's a because it's a law. I mean, we're not act you know we're not going to actively go out and you know we know this person's having a party. We're not actively looking to create problems and 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 take it. But when we get these calls for service, if we don't take an action, then the issue is well, why aren't you you know where we were always run into that issue is why are you not ticketing them but you're ticketing me. Um, you know, why are you, you know, uh, why are you differentiating here? But then when it's, you know, foliage season and people are parking everywhere, you know, that's, that's just where we sometimes run into that problem. Um, and, and really it's when we get the call for service, it's not necessarily an issue of an officer who's proactively going around and saying, Hey, you know, uh, so-and-so is having a party. I'm going to ticket everybody on that, on that particular roadway. It's really like, you know, a neighbor that's calling us and saying so and so is having a party. You need to come ticket everybody on this road. And yes, we you know we certainly stop in and 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 try to make that announcement and get people to move. But I think that's that's where really my uneasiness always comes in because it's like it, it, that 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 slippery slope. I'm okay if you want to try it, Neil. But I think we're going to have to have some parameters. Or you're just going to get a call from the other neighbor who doesn't like that neighbor saying, "Why are they parked in front of my in my no parking zone?" Well, I know. I think we we do need parameters and that's what i was i mean that's what i'm interested in us discussing and coming up with those parameters you know like julie said safety length of time is it a busy road um you know is it maybe just their property do they have neighbors so i think you know it, but i would like to have a, a standard set of those that that we could look at every time and yeah. not have it just be like oh well i know this guy he's a he's a good guy or something you know yeah. like everyone wants i like standardization yeah. So, I mean, so Neil, one thought that I had um, is Alex is um, what if uh, people come in and get a permit that, uh, for that day, you know, they come in. I mean, I know Washington, D.C., for instance, you can go get a permit if you want to uh, park on the street for, you know, the weekend and you're visiting um, my sister and I go to the police station, I get the permit, I get it for the two days that I'm there and I can park on the street. It's really nice. I'm legal. I'm safe. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm good. They know that the tickets on my car front windshield, you know, and I don't feel like I'm parking anywhere I shouldn't be. So if you can give a permit and you can even say, you know, if you want to make it really specific, you can say they're going to be 15 extra cars and each person gets that little ticket and they put in the front of a car and you know that you don't ticket those cars. But if there's a 16th car, then, hey, that's the only got a permit for 15 cars. I, but I that like that idea. It, you know, that keeps you, you, people have to come in and they have to ask and then the neighbors can't complain because they've gotten a permit. Just a thought. Oh, I love it. Yeah, as long as it's, as long as it's, it might be hard for us though to distinguish safety, you know, whether, whether we're. Well, I think that's why it's, it's the decision of the, you know, the input based on, you know, the, the police chief and the highway superintendent. You right, know, like so we, it has to be a, a case by case, as in not case yeah, by yeah. case, I, meant, I didn't mean that I meant um, a street, you know, a location oh. by location. Oh, I think yeah, every listen. every request is judged on that the criteria. It's like, well, if someone, um, I don't know, pick pick a, like the busiest worst street, and if they said, "Oh, I want to be able to park here," um, like we would never allow it, right? We're right. Just like, oh, it's yes. not safe, you know. But there, yeah. are, if someone's on a dead end road, and the reason we made it no parking is because everyone was parking there, um, and it was creating problems in the winter for plowing, but it's July. You know, it's like, well, this isn't going to cause a problem for plowing. So, right. yeah, we should allow it. You know, that's, I think it has to be based on, on every single request, uh, input from people who know. And that's one of the criteria that, that gets it approved or not approved. 
you don't you can't just ask and automatically get it. You right. have, to, you have right. to check these things off. I could get behind that. I would say, you know, parking on one side of the street only if you're going to be encroaching on the road. That would be my only suggestion. Yeah, no, I think that's that's it. That would be part of it, right? We'd have these rules that would lay it out too. So uh, we could start working on that. Okay, thanks, people. Um, that's all we have for the uh, Town Borders Police Commission. And so um, I'd like to adjourn the uh, Town Borders Police Commission meeting. Second. And <clears throat> make a motion to. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And uh, a motion to open the continuation of the public hearing on the critical environmental areas. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And if anyone has Aye. any uh, comments for that, I'd ask you to uh, raise your hand. And uh, keep your comments to three minutes. Um, if you don't mind just raising your Zoom hand because we can't always see uh, the physical box. Raising hand. Okay. Um, so, uh, John. Gatto, please. John G. I assume it's John Gatto. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is John Gatto. Uh, I'm speaking first as uh, chairman of the Clean Water Open Space Protection Commission, CWASP. I remind the board that CWASP had submitted a letter of support on February 6, 2020, recommending adoption of the CEA resolution proposed at that time. The support of CWASP as expressed in that letter remains today. Support is based on a fundamental value placed on using objective facts to help guide decision-making about land use, whether in the context of preservation or development. Now speaking as an individual town resident, I express my hope that the adoption of the current scaled back CEA resolution will eventually be followed by its expansion to the original number of designated areas. The environmental features that define a CEA are simply a listing of things that actually exist, not something that should be either chosen or disregarded. The true utility of the CEA is best served when the CEA accurately reflects the objective features of all areas that would qualify for a designation. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you. Uh, our, our tiering. Thank you. Um, I'm here to read two letters that have been submitted for um, uh, in support of the CEAs. Um, I'm reading uh, one letter by Lind Linda Brotman and another letter by uh, Roland Barrett. Uh, first, I'll read uh, the Linda Brotman one. To the town board, I'm a resident of New Paltz. I have been following developments surrounding the Environmental Conservation Board proposal to establish critical environmental areas in the town. I fully support the current proposal that includes two CEAs, the Schwangunk and the Plutarch CEAs. These CEAs will serve to increase public awareness of these environmentally important sites. They will also ensure that developers considering significant projects in or adjacent to the CEAs are aware of the need to take the CEAs into consideration. Thank you for considering the CEA proposal and my input. I look forward to learning that the CEA will be approved. Yours, Linda Brotman. Uh, the second one is from Ro Roland Barrett. Uh, it has come to my attention that the town board will soon have be having another public hearing on establishing critical environmental areas within the town. I'm also aware that the board has reduced the number of CEAs from six to two please consider the following. One, going from six to two is a backward approach to the care of the New Paltz environment. It is not in keeping with New Paltz environmentally friendly reputation. Couldn't some of the other four have been modified in size instead of eliminated? Two, I hear the same story that developers would have to pay more in fees and consults. Wait a minute, they are business. They are a business. That is what businesses do, invest and hopefully get a return. If one business developer doesn't have enough investment capital, another will. Three, 
Checking a CEA box on an application tells the interested parties that more attention has been given to the area in question and more will be given. If some of the planning board members who are volunteers after all, feel overburdened with work and dislike duplications of box checks, then the town board should re-examine the structure or, and workload of the planning board. Frankly, I don't know how they do it all. Four, as more and more people get on board with the impacts of accelerated climate change, our future planning board volunteers and others are going to have to be even more environmentally minded. The town board should set the stage for new volunteers, show leadership, establishing the CEAs as a start, re-examining the increasing and increasing from just two would be, would be better. Five, fragmentation is real. It cuts off the, the movement of wildlife between food sources, as well as the search for mates, with the additional loss of the ensuing variations in offspring. Fragmentation also allows invasive plant and animals to do their thing, invade with less than desirable consequences. Six, the, the Ridge CEA is a no-brainer. We are so lucky to be bordered by the Mohonk Preserve. However, the town should do its part as well. The described CEA should be fully protected. Allowing for edge development uh, on nine acres also sets the stage for future nibble development, subdividing the nine for the in-laws or seeking a variance to squeeze in another lot year after initial development. Seven, given maximum protection to the Plutarch wildlife, wetlands and adjacent woods. Unfortunately, roads skirt the wetlands and woods causing a fragmentation of wildlife movement. Year by year, vehicles take their toll as wildlife crosses from aquatic areas to terrestrial and back again a month or so later. Some wildlife species have to have both areas in order to survive. Eight, I have a well. It has never run dry. I know the water cycle the rain must enter the ground, likely through wetlands, which allow percolation down to the underlying geologic strata. In my case, there would be a slow flow through cracks and fissures toward the, towards the Wallkill River. And since I live near the river, my well is kept full. I thank Plutarch Wetlands for this bountiful supply, protect the critical environmental areas, RB. Uh, thank you, those are the two letters. Thank you. Uh, Janelle? Thank you. Um, I am going to be making my own comments tonight as well as reading uh, two additional letters. Um, I'll begin with my own comments. I'm speaking as a Town of New Paltz resident and the designated coordinator for New Paltz Climate Smart. I would like to register my strong and continued support for the adoption of critical environmental areas. As your coordinator, for New Paltz Climate Smart, my role is to help this municipality to take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to a changing climate. We need to protect large, connected, resilient landscapes, such as the proposed critical environmental areas to enable species to migrate in our rapidly warming climate. Some of the benefits of a CEA designation are that they promote more proactive planning, and designed to conserve critical areas by focusing attention on reducing fragmentation of large intact habitats and forest corridors. However, they do not affect construction of a single family dwelling on an approved lot. They do not regulate development like zoning does, and they do not require the preparation of an environmental impact statement. As the town website actually specifies, the purpose of the designation is to alert landowners, developers, and regulatory agencies to exceptional or unique local environmental features during the state environmental quality review. The designation ensures that these features are not overlooked and that potential impactful impact, excuse me, harmful impacts to them are evaluated in determining the significance of a proposed action. As this board has requested, the number of CEAs proposed has been greatly reduced. And now is the time to adopt the present proposal without any further delay. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, if I didn't say at the front, my name is Janelle Piotr and I am the New Paltz Climate Smart Coordinator. Um, I now would like to read um, two additional uh, letters and um, one second while I pull them up. Um, the first one is from Jim O'Dowd, 
Um, uh, Jim states and Jim and Janet, his wife. Uh, we are writing to voice our strong support for the Environmental Conservation Advisory Board's proposal to establish critical environmental areas or CEAs in New Paltz. New Paltz is beauty, quality of life, and attractiveness to residents and tourists alike relies on the health of our notable threatened habitats like the Schwangunk Ridge on the west side of town. But people often forget less visible but equally important habitats like the Plutarch wetlands and woods on the east side of town. These need to be protected to provide clean water, habitat connectedness, and the beautiful views of the gunks to town. Adding them as CEAs merely offers the possibility that they are considered in new developments in these areas. We hope that in the near future, areas like the Wall uh, Wallkill Climate Kill Corridor, Clearwater Woods, Swarta Kill Wetlands, and Stony Kill Woods will be recognized as CEAs as well. As parents to three sons, two of whom graduated from high school here, and grandparents to five grandchildren who visit us here in our beautiful town, we are particularly aware of the need to protect important ecosystems for the next generation. As our climate changes, these areas will not only be refuges for wildlife, but security for people like our grandchildren and yours. Please vote to support the proposal to establish these CEAs. Thank you, Janet O'Dowd and Jim O'Dowd, Town of New Paltz. Lastly, um, I would like to read a letter from Kara Lee. Um, Kara Lee begins, I, am, um, I, I'm supporting designating the New Paltz portion of the Schwangunk Ridge and the Plutarch Northwoods areas as critical environmental areas as defined under New York State Environmental Quality Review Act, Seeker. These are distinct geographical areas with well-documented, exceptional, and unique environmental characteristics. Both areas are irreplaceable assets to our community and are particularly vulnerable to impacts associated with development. Concerns have been raised that designated these CEAs will prevent development and that designations will require the planning board to apply a vaguely defined, quote, hard look, unquote, that will lead to lengthy reviews that will be costly to the town. The purpose of a CEA is not to prevent development, but to ensure that development within the designated are designed with a high degree of sensitivity to the natural landscape and features. A CE designation will require the planning board and a developer to take some additional steps when conducting a review of projects that will disturb over 10 acres. With existing tools and well-defined steps, the planning board can accomplish this without undue cost, considering the high environmental values that are at stake for our community. Concern has also been raised that the CEA designations will limit development of affordable housing. While affordable housing is a keenly important issue for our community, the areas proposed are not ideally suited for this type of development as they are not served by public transportation, are not in walkable neighborhoods or close to services of any kind. The 50 mile long Schwangunk Ridge is one of the three wilderness areas within a hundred mile radius of New York City. Its unique combination of geology, soils, elevation support, a variety of diverse arrays of plants and animals adapted to its specific conditions. The Nature Conservancy has ranked it as globally important forest block, as in greater than 15,000 acres, able to support wide ranging and area sensitive species, especially those that are dependent on interior forests. As well as being the scenic backdrop to our community, the ridge is the watershed for our drinking water supply reservoir and the gunks are ever more popular recreational destination, all vital economic assets. The Schwangunk Ridge environment is more susceptible to serious disturbance than other types of environments because ground disturbance can cause severe erosion, Surface runoff can contaminate headwater mountain streams. Very thin soils present septic problems. Excessive or poorly planned development can fragment forest blocks and disrupt habitat and wildlife quarters. 
and elevation makes development more visible from the valley. There is a common misconception in New Paltz that the ridge is, quote, already protected due to Mohawk Preserve's protected land and the more recent River to Ridge property. In fact, although most of the ridge top is protected, most of the slopes and foothills are primarily in private ownership and will face development pressure with increased demand for housing in our area. Maintaining intact forest, habit connectivity, and view shed protection are all important conservation design strategies for this area. The wetland woodland complex on the northeast side of town includes the hamlets, hamlets of Plutarch and Ohioville and are recognized as regionally significant resource. Protecting this area is part of the town's investment in green infrastructure, natural resources that will sustain our community by providing clean water, clean air and flood protection. These wetlands and woodlands serve multiple other functions, including aquifer recharge, pollution filtering and wildlife habitat. Maintaining unfragmented wetland woodland habitat is the most critical conservation design strategy for this valuable complex. Steps for reviewing uh, projects in CEAs. Number one, define the CEA area and state its purpose. Provide a map and, a, and uh, state the purpose of the CEA. Two, um, project reviews should include use of a EAF long form, use the seeker environmental assessment long form to evaluate likely impacts of the project. Use additional questions specific to the CEA. Work with conservation partners, the ENCB and others to create a checklist of additional questions that are particularly relevant to protection of the CEA characteristics and vulnerabilities such as a degree of the forest fragmentation, proximity to protected land, connectivity, et cetera. The ENCB should be directed to develop a summary of the salient characteristics of the CEA area that require particular attention. Use the natural resources inventory, the NRI mapper. The town of New Paltz has developed an excellent GIS mapping tool for evaluating the extent and nature of natural resources on a parcel by parcel basis, which is an invaluable planning tool for the planning board and applicants considering conservation evaluation and design. Employ conservation planning for subdivisions. Require subdivision applicants to prepare a conservation design plan to avoid impacts on features on the property and to assign 50% of the property for conservation as required by existing town code. In conclusion, other communities in Ulster County have adopted for stronger alternatives than CEA designation, such as overlay districts or special permitting for critical environmental areas in their towns, i.e. Town of Schwangunk has a ridge overlay district and Gardner has special permit ridge zoning. New Paltz may ultimately also wish to adopt stronger measures for the two environmental areas proposed. And that concludes the comments by Carol Lee. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank um, you. Liz Lee. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Liz Lee. I'm with the Voter Reform Committee of Ulster Activists and a resident of the town of New Paltz. I am here tonight to ask the board members to pass the resolution for the, uh, to support the Congressional Senate Bill for the People Act as one. The bill ensures voting rights for everyone, equal access for voters in the election process and protects voting rights for all. Tom Denton had emailed the resolution to town supervisor, uh, Neil Betts. And I hope each of the members had received a copy of the resolution. Um, 
and to approve the resolution tonight. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. It's, it's number 10 on the agenda. So we'll get to thank it tonight. You. Thanks. Um, any other um, <clears throat> comments about the, um, for their public hearing? If not, um, yes, I see Susan. 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 Oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Susan. I was uh... okay. Okay, um, I'm reading this letter from Tom Aldowd and Daniel Daniel Schneiderwin. Dear town board members, we are writing to urge you to approve the ENCB's recommendation for the designation of two critical environmental areas. In March 2020, we wrote to encourage the enactment of their initial full proposal, and we look forward to the adoption of the other four CEAs. We are glad to see that the Plutarch Woods and Wetlands have been put forward for this first stage. For many years, we've been part of a team that surveys this area as part of the National Audubon Society's Christmas Bird Count, the longest running wildlife census in New Paltz and in the world. As our results have repeatedly demonstrated, this area hosts an unusual diversity of species of high concentration, excuse me, of high conservation priority, most notably the red-headed woodpecker. The red-headed woodpecker's precipitous population decline has been well documented, leading to its addition to the International Union for the Conservation of the Nature's Red List, among other related uh, listings. The wet woods in this part of town host the only enduring population of this species in Ulster County and one of the very few in this region. So below we have included an updated version of our earlier letter, which remains pertinent to your consideration of the revised proposal. We are writing as longtime New Pulse residents and products of the New Pulse Central School District to express our strong support for the full adaption of the ENCB CEA proposal. Doing so would be in accord with what New Pulse residents have for years made clear, that there is a broad based support for protecting the landscapes whose existence makes New Pulse so special. This community priority is evidenced by not only the town's open space plan and by efforts towards comprehensive planning, but also by the now two decade long run of electoral results in which New Pulse voters have repeatedly chosen candidates who support conservation measures just like this one. As others have pointed out, the ENCB's delineations were drawn directly from the best available studies provided by a wide range of relevant experts, including the New York State Natural Heritage Program, Ulster County, the Nature Conservancy, the DEC, La Bruna and Clemens Northern Walk Hill Biodiversity Plan 2007, and the TONP Open Space Plan 2006 areas that qualify as CEAs based on their recognition of these independent, empirically CEAs could potentially comprise a sizable portion of the town reflects a remarkable advantage for New Pauls, not a problem to be overcome. As the CEAs, I'm sorry, my puppy is biting me. Um, as the CEAs proposal describes, each of these areas is unique and sensitive. They were identified for specific reasons and their designation as CEAs would reflect values widely held in New Paltz, including the value of protecting clean water, fragile habitats, and the vulnerable species that depend on them. Of course, as all seem to agree, the Shuangunk Ridge should be a CEA, but an approach to landscape planning that is concerned with not only the most iconic and charismatic landscape is clearly inadequate in an area of species extinction and habitat loss unprecedented in human history. The designation of the Plutarch Woods and Wetlands as the CEA would guarantee a minimum threshold of oversight in an area that is less heralded, heralded through still widely recognized to be significantly, significant ecologically. The other primary criticism that we have seen that existing environmental review mechanisms are already sufficient is one we've heard every time a new conservation measure is put forward. Compared to many of these previous measures, the impact of CEA, the impact of CEA designation is utterly mild. Some have called it restrictive. Frankly, we wish it was restrictive. It isn't. Instead, as you know, it merely assures that environmental reviews are done carefully within already existing review protocols. 
and um, I'm just going to get to the end here because this is a little longer. Um, once upon a time, I'll bet in our lifetimes, town board members were elected on militant pro-property rights, pro-developer, and anti-conservation platforms. And yet this has not happened in over two decades because New Paul's voters have consistently opted instead for candidates committed to protecting wetlands, to avoiding reckless construction, and to preserving the landscapes that make New Paul special. Each of you were elected by these voters, by residents who voted for you precisely because they expected you to support measures just like this one. Now is the time to embrace the principles that you ran on and that you share with those who elected you. While the critiques provided by a few planning board members should of course be listened to, planning board members are, unlike all of you, not elected and are therefore less incentivized to take positions consistent with those of the public. Adopting the current CEA proposal in its entirety will place you squarely in line with the trajectory that New Paltz residents have repeatedly for two decades shown that they want the town to go. Sincerely, Tom O'Dowd, former member of the TONP Clean Water and Open Space Preservation Commission, and Daniel Schneiderwin. And I'm happy to read that for them. Thank you. Thanks, Ingrid. Thank you, good evening. Um, I have a few letters that um, members of the public requested uh, to share with you. Uh, the first is from Fran Dunwell, who was trying to make it into the meeting and couldn't for some reason. Um, she writes, I live within the boundary of the proposed Shuangunk Ridge CEA and wish to lend my support for the proposed designation. This is a unique and special part of New Paltz that deserves the extra care and attention a CEA would provide. The unique habitats and environmental benefits this ecosystem provides can be better conserved if they are considered in the beginning of the planning process as part of any subdivision or development. Homes and roads can be placed where they will avoid adverse impacts. Expert advice can be provided by the environmental board. By avoiding adverse impacts and using expert input, the development process can actually be smoothed out helping to avoid some types of conflict that come when problems are discovered at the end. I encourage the board to vote yes on this proposal. Sincerely, Fran Dunwell. Um, and the next letter is from Emily Svensson. I write as an environmental attorney and a New Paltz native to express my support for the designation of critical environmental areas in the town of New Paltz. CEA designation is a valuable means of documenting the environmental sensitivity of specified lands to ensure that town officials landowners and developers are informed about the ecosystem value of those lands. CEA designation does not impose any new regulation. It simply creates a public record of known environmental resources to inform, inform environmental review under CECRA. As a former town board member in the town of Hyde Park, I can assure you that the CEAs in our town uh, that were designated over 10 years ago have not stifled development. Instead, they support a more efficient CEQRA review because ecological information is available upfront. Modern developers complete their CEQRA environmental assessment form online and the state database automatically completes several fields to ensure accuracy. CEAs are one of those fields. If, the New, Paltz, if New Paltz designates CEAs, when a developer begins an EA for a project, the system will note the CEA so the developer and planning board have that information from step one. As an environmental attorney, I see too many CEQRA reviews where important natural resources are minimized or ignored. When I present training programs on local environmental protection, I teach local leaders that CEAs provide a valuable non-regulatory tool to ensure ecologically rich areas are recognized during the CEQRA review. Your ENCB has done a tremendous job of gathering and synthesizing data to identify several habitat areas that span multiple properties. CEA designation honors their effort by ensuring that their research is readily available for future town officials when town plans are updated and when development is proposed in sensitive areas. Having spent the first 18 years of my life in New Paltz, I know that the town is blessed with a wealth of ecological resources. Documenting the most valuable areas with CEA status will ensure that future construction is crafted to preserve that ecological heritage. I urge you to move forward with CEA adoption. Thank you for your consideration. And if I can provide further information, please contact me. 
Uh, the following letter is from Laura Heady. She writes, I'm writing you in a personal capacity to share my comments on the proposed CEAs and my experience as a former resident and planning board member in the village of New Paltz. I now live in neighboring Rosendale and workshop, dine and enjoy outdoor recreation in New Paltz. In the book, Suburban Nation, The Rise of Sprawl and the Decline of the American Dream, the authors state, quote, to truly improve quality of life, the planning codes must define open space with the same degree of precision and concern that they now apply to the design of parking lots, unquote. It's true. Volunteers on planning boards and zoning boards have explicit directions on requirements like numbers of parking spaces, widths of sidewalks, and size of outdoor signs, but they are given relatively little guidance on how to effectively protect the natural systems that sustain our communities with clean water and clean air. These open spaces not only keep the community resilient to environmental and climate change, but also provide the scenic backdrop and outdoor playground that attract residents and visitors who in turn support the local economy. It's so important that decisions that can permanently change the natural landscape are thoughtful and well-informed. CEAs are an excellent example of how informed land use policy can create a predictable process for both planners and project sponsors. By identifying important places in the municipality in a formal and public way, all parties involved in the land use process are equipped with the same information about community values. I recall when I was on the village planning board, we did not have any guiding tools like CEAs when we were faced with large projects like Woodland Pond. We had to navigate the specific code requirements related to details like parking lots the understandable impatience of aging neighbors who were anxious for Woodland Pond to be built, and the steady ongoing stream of new information and rising concerns by residents about impacts to nature. I suspect the prolonged deliberations could have been streamlined had the village been proactive in creating a blueprint for future conservation and development. CEAs can be a part of that blueprint and an important step in defining open space with the same degree of precision and concern commonly applied to the design of parking lots. I think New Paltz is the kind of community that will want to be celebrated for its thoughtful open spaces and healthy residents and not its well-designed parking lots. Thank you for taking uh, time to consider my comments. And lastly, from Scenic Hudson, uh, these comments submitted by Nava Tabak, Director of Science, Climate and Stewardship. I'm writing on behalf of Scenic Hudson to support, express our support for your Environmental Conservation Board's proposal to designate CEAs in the town of New Paltz. We wish to reiterate the importance of the Plutarch Woods and Wetlands area to larger regional conservation priorities in which Scenic Hudson and several conservation partners have invested considerable efforts. We submitted comments in support of the proposed CEAs in March 2020 which I hope you will reference for greater detail on the many ecological benefits of this area. They include remarkably intact natural communities, supporting a great diversity of species, landscape connectivity, climate resilience, and irreplaceable water resources. The biggest threat to this unique natural area is fragmentation by a gradual and piecemeal encroachment of development. On their own, federal and state regulations do not adequately protect regional resources such as the proposed CEAs in New Paltz. It's up to municipalities to ensure their long-term persistence. As you know, a CEA designation would not prevent development, but would rather assist you as local decision makers to find smart growth solutions and avoid the irreversible fragmentation of critical habitats. We hope you'll join us in working towards a future in which the natural assets of the Hudson Valley, which are one of the reasons it is such a desirable place to live, are balanced with the growing needs of the human community. Nava Tabak. Um, and we had a request from residents Libby Zemitis and Laura Dene to share a five minute video that they produced about CEAs. Um, I don't know if that's possible at this point, but um, I do have it queued up. Neil, does that sound all right? <laughs> yeah, we're only an hour late for the meeting. Why not? Make it longer. Well, I'd be interested in seeing it. Watch it on YouTube, but yeah, sure, we can watch it. 
I mean, the, my frustration is all of these letters have been submitted to us. We have them already. I already read them today. And now I have to be, they're read to me again, like I can't read, but. The individuals who submitted those letters asked for them to be read during the public hearing. But if we want to show the movie, we should get going. We have a lot on the agenda tonight. Uh, I'm not taking that as, as a, um, an encouragement to go for it. So you can continue your meeting. You're, you're more than welcome to show it. Well, my, my proposal would be to extend the public, continue to extend the public hearing. And why don't we show the video at the next public hearing, kick off the next public hearing with that video. Well, if the, when this topic, my opinion about that is I just wonder why we're extending it and why don't we move, you know, can move forward. So my opinion is, is, you know, I'd like to have a discussion about that, I guess. So my, and my input is to, is to not just prolong this, you know, it's been something we've been considering for quite a while. I think when we, we talked about this before, you know, David had very strong feelings that we needed to make sure everyone who was in both of these areas knew about this. And we'd even discussed possibly ma mailing something to all of them. And we were gonna look into the cost for that. I don't think we've done that. Um, we don't, you know, so we kind of agreed as a board to do that, which is why I'm reluctant to close the public hearing because we did talk about leaving it open. Um, but that's just based on our conversations before, which is why I thought we were continuing the public hearing and why maybe David suggested we would show the video at the next one. But that's, I'm, I'm happy to have a discussion about that. I just feel like we have a lot of people here now that might like to see the video and it just seems an efficient way to, to have, you know, to spread information and it's being offered. I don't know, I don't, personally, I think it's, it would be lovely to, to see something that's being offered. I have no problem. I, have no I don't problem mind seeing the video. Um, I, I do think that we also don't have an issue with us holding the public hearing open. Um, I know we're going to talk about this later, but uh, I do anticipate that we're going to go into person very soon based on the governor's executive order. Um, and I do think that there's something that has been semi lost in not just this specific public hearing, but public dialogue at large due to a lack of in person meetings. So I'm kind of fine with just even laying just for an additional meeting as well. I do think we sometimes get more people <laughs> by Zoom. I'm not saying we should stay Zoom, but it's, uh, I, I, I feel like there's a lot of people that can come because it's Zoom. But anyways, I think the issue is, is the video. Are we gonna show that or not? Sure, go ahead. I'm fine with seeing the video. Do you hear anything? But a local level, we're modeling a planning approach for the future that it's not only going to help people through tourism and the economy, right. it's not only going to help wildlife by having intact habitat, but it's also going to help the community be resilient to climate change. I could hear it perfectly, Ingrid. Yeah, I could as well. I was just stopping. Sorry. I could hear it. It kept pausing, but we could hear it fine.
I'm sorry, I couldn't, when I shared the video, I couldn't hear anything and I'm not sure if you could hear anything and then it seemed like I was muted, so. Yeah, we can hear it, it was fine. Oh, okay, I'll do it again, I'm sorry. Where is it? Sorry, no. I'm sorry, I'm not, I, it closed out and I'm not able to do this quickly to pull it back up again. Take, take your time. I'm sorry if I was um, overly aggressive before. Okay, here we go. But at a local level, Warsing is really modeling a planning approach for the future that's not only gonna help people through tourism and the economy, it's not only gonna help wildlife by having intact habitat, but it's also gonna help the community be resilient to climate change. This is beautiful. We're gonna be meeting with John Adams, who is a resident of Warsing, and he's a farmer. When did you recognize that this area was so important? Well, we see a lot of wildlife, turkeys, black bear, Year, of course. This is an important area as a wildlife corridor between the Catskills and the Shongams. There are certain species of wildlife that really rely on connections in the land to move about. So we're trying to prevent development from severing connections in nature. This used to be a dairy farm which was run by the New York State Department of Corrections and the farm which has not been in use for 10 years now makes a beautiful land bridge between Minnewaska State Park and uh, the Vernoy Kill State Forest and the Catskill Park beyond it. A critical environmental area, or a CEA, is a designation that a local agency can put on land of unique or exceptional value. I grew up on a farm on the other side of the ridge. The lay of the land is very similar. And I think deep inside, that's what really touched me. What is required to establish a CEA is for a community to first know what it prioritizes. They need to document why it's important and map the area. We discussed the uh, designation of two critical environmental areas in the town. It's relatively easy, but you need to take an inventory and see what you have and do an open space plan. And you have to get it approved by the town board and it has to have a public hearing. Then it gets approved. The area is critical because it could be an area to buffer the effects of climate change. It's a beautiful area. And I think we're really on the right page. Cedar Swamp is about 8,000 acres. It's actually one of the largest complexes of its kind in the Catskill region. Oh, wow. It's exciting that the town is acknowledging that yeah. by including it in the open space plan and also adding this critical environmental area designation. It will help prevent flooding because the wetlands will absorb some water during heavy rains. And it will also help with the water supply because it will hold some water during dry seasons, and which will continue to park into the ground. I mean, the last few summers have been very rainy, which I think there's been a lot of flooding, um, a lot more flooding than I remember. They all got the message that the environment is important. Yeah. <clears throat> without, without clean water, there's no sense being here. I 
think the locals always recognized that the natural beauty of the area was important, not only for environmental reasons, but for um, economic reasons as well. Colony Farm is right in the middle, which could be a potential economic resource if we can open it up to the public and get in some agritourism. Mm -hmm. This town board, I know it's, it's bipartisan. I think everyone's on the same page because they've recognized what they have and they don't want to lose it. We find that some communities are taking action because they've enrolled in the Climate Smart Communities program. In this case, what we're seeing already was taking these kinds of steps. So we're actually exploring with them the idea of maybe they could take the Climate Smart Community Pledge. That'll increase their opportunity to get funding, to get technical assistance, and to even become more resilient. We're talking about becoming a Climate Smart Community, so I'm hoping we can continue to, to work in that direction. I would love to see all of the communities in the Hudson Valley taking similar approaches to what Worsing has done. All contributing to a valley that has large forests still here, has huge wetland complexes, has streams that are able to flow freely. I mean, it's irreplaceable. It's irreplaceable. It is. Climate Smart Communities is a certification program that provides guidance and funding support for local municipalities. Conserving natural habitats is just one action that communities can take to adapt. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more, any more comments? Um, there are no more comments. Does the, the board, do uh, you guys have any thoughts about uh, continuing the public hearing yeah. to um, July 15th? I'm curious what others think, uh, you know, is it, is it possible, can we just sort of look down the road and, and think about when we would end it, when we would close it? Um, David, do you, do you have a thought about it? Well, my thoughts, uh, relate more to um, our agenda in general and the time we're spending. Um, you know, it occurs to me that we have, um, we've done an incredible job uh, and we continue to do an incredible job on um, protecting our environment, protecting open spaces. We have the national, the, the natural resources inventory, which just was completed. Uh, we're taxing sales of home sales to protect open space in our community, we have an open space plan. Um, we've, I'd like to move forward on critical environmental areas, but I would like to do so in a more measured way um, with the, you know, our, our planning board attorney and our engineer, both expressing real caution in moving too fast. Uh, and everyone but one of our planning board members asking us to please just do one first and let us see how it works. Uh, I'm the liaison for that planning board. I see how hard they're working. They're asking for something and, and, and our paid experts are advising us really clearly. So I'm all in favor of um, approving the Shangam Ridge zone initially and promising or pledging to look at the second zone once we see how this operates. Um, that said, uh, just because I was called out in the paper recently, um, I do live in the Shawangunk Ridge zone. I own more than 10 acres. My property would be subject to the critical environmental area um, in, in my community. Although I have a conservation easement on my land that goes way beyond anything the CEA will do and feel very good about the fact that, you know, I have very limited rights to do anything with my property um, and I'm very happy with that. But I think we want to move cautiously and carefully. I also think we owe it to our community to listen to all of the voices in our community. And some of those voices are not heard in our meetings on a regular basis. And some of those voices are asking us, what are you gonna do about affordable housing? What are you gonna to do to address you know, lack of senior housing? Um, and I really want to move to begin to marry and see the intersection of those kind of projects 
with it within our community, clearly not in areas that are, um, you know, critical environmental areas or, or, or areas that are like, hey, you shouldn't put something up against that water source. But I also want to make sure that we're not just cordoning off all of New Paltz and saying, this is going to be a parkland um, and that we can welcome all residents to this community and stand up for all the folks who live here or want to live here. Um, and, you know, the statements that, oh, these projects don't belong in certain areas is like, that's kind of a NIMBY kind of answer. I b actually believe some of those affordable housing projects do belong in some of the finer and more beautiful, the most beautiful areas of our, of our community. So I just don't want to start closing off certain areas before we start really discussing how affordable housing intersects with conservation. So I don't, I don't disagree that Plutarch Woods is a critical environmental area or the other four areas are also really important environmental areas, but our attorney and our, you know, our engineer specifically said, if you want it, if you want to be unambiguous, put it in your code, code it and say, and say what, you're, what you're preventing and what you're asking for, what you're, what you're requiring. But otherwise it's a very ambiguous designation. Um, and I don't, I don't really, I would like to see it start to operate within our planning board in a successful way. David, I think that you uh, probably took the words right out of my mouth, except far more eloquently <laughs> than I would have said. Um, I think one of my biggest preoccupations is exactly the concept of affordable housing and creating spaces for people to come and have places to live. We have alienated a whole community that has nowhere to live here from young students who wanna stay in the area to families coming in that might not be the very high-end breadwinners from New York City, but people from around here who wanna just buy a home uh, to people maybe from cities like Poughkeepsie and Kingston that wanna live in this beautiful area, but they can't afford it. And there is no affordable housing in New Paltz. And that's a big problem because going into the future, we need to think about that and why they can't be in these beautiful areas is, is sort of beyond me, you know, why, why can't you have both affordable housing and beautiful areas to live in? Um, and I agree with moving slowly and seeing how one area works, uh, talking to our lawyers, talking to um, the, the town planners and figuring out how that's gonna look and taking our time to apply this to different areas. I love that the community has come out and supported this. I love seeing the videos. I love seeing the letters and hearing the letters and hearing the amount of devotion and dedication and planning that has gone into this. I mean, there's some individuals that have been coming back to us, giving us some top presentations and very eloquent letters on why this is necessary. But I do think that we have to we have to have caution and we have to go slowly and not just say, well, let's go ahead and just do this. But um, I parallel what you just said, David, and I think we need to look at it carefully and start with one, see how it works, and then move on to the rest. I just wanted to chime in and say, um, you know, please no one take this as a, a knock to people who are on our meeting, but um, people have been really well organized in coming to talk about the CEAs, and I'm very excited uh, about this proposal. But specifically when it comes to affordable housing, um, I don't think that we see the same level of organization. And, and sometimes that also has to do with the population who it serves are also not as likely to participate in these kind of forums and dynamics. Um, and I never like pitting issues against issues, to be fair, because I think they're both very much important issues. But I will note that it's about nine o'clock at night and we have not started our town board meeting. And that's fine. This is our job. But it does highlight that we have a limited time to do a lot of work that a lot of people are passionate about. Um, and we've spent a ton of time on this. And I, I really do want to talk more about affordable housing in our community. I think that we're not going to hear the same kind of public comment that we just did on it. That doesn't mean people don't need it. I think actually it's, it's one of the most critical things that's not just happening in our community, but our county right now. Um, and I would like to see us uh, definitely start this process, but also really dedicate some very real time for affordable housing. We're doing a lot with police reform. I also think that's great. But um, again, we, 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 we are a part-time board for the five of us. And uh, we have a lot of important issues before us. And I do think that um, other issues, specifically housing, is something I'd like to see us um, take a serious, serious focus on moving forward. 
Oh, uh, what I will say is, <clears throat> I apologize if I was um, grumpy earlier, um, I, but I think part of it is, uh, and what I will say is, you know, affordable housing and the environment should, should never be pitted against one another. And I don't think they are. I think what it is, is we have a finite amount of time. And it, it's not just the time in this meeting where we, you know, it's nine o'clock, you know, but it's, it's all during the week. You know, like, and I was frustrated maybe because we, we, we received all these letters, then we had to listen to them again. And I think that's great, but you know, that was an hour of my day right there. Um, I only have so many hours in the day. I really wanna start working on this affordable housing. We have promised people that we would do that um, and we have it. And part of it is we're spending a ton of time on the uh, police reform, which is good, it needs to be done. But we also said in January, that affordable housing was going to be a priority for us this year. And we maybe talked about it at one meeting. It just doesn't come up because everything get, it gets pushed aside by the loudest voices in the room, which I like. Um, but, you know, I do not want to spend the next several months going over this again and again and again. Um, I'd like to move forward on it. Um, I, we have to move on. We have to do other stuff. You know, we, we talk about affordable housing, but there's also, you know, the police reform. We have a lot of big construction projects. Um, you know, I, I appreciate it. We, we, we've been talking about this for a while now. We, we asked, the, the ENCB came at us with six. We said, please scale it down. Uh, we were, I thought we were gonna do one. Um, ENCB came back and said, we want two. I, I appreciate that too, that, you know, it's hard to choose your favorite um, area to preserve. Um, in the end, you know, I'm in favor of doing one and promising that we will revisit it, um, a, a, in particular, the Plutarch Woods in a year, right? Uh, we'll come back to it after the planning board, you know, when we show people that, you know, this is useful to do and it's not the end of the world and that it's not going to, the world isn't going to fall apart. I think we have to work with our partners on the planning board, like David said, um, we can't be adversarial all the time. I think if we ease them into it, I think we can show them that it does work and there are a lot of benefits. You know, it's, it's New Pulse, change is hard, right? That's why the New Pulse Times is a dollar and a half. Um, so just my thoughts. Uh, yes, so I'm certainly um, not of the mind of, of the, I suppose the rest of the board. I'm think the two is is certainly minimal. And, um, you know, I'm discouraged that, there, that this discussion has, you know, shifted to be talking about something that, you know, some of you had set, have said it's not a, you know, not right to pit one thing against another yet it was. And I don't think, you know, this should be, it's very discouraging to volunteers and, and to, you know, this has been worked on for three years. So um, it's ready to go. Um, I don't know why two is so hard to swallow, to be honest. Um, the reason we talked about two is for one, for me, was because of all the work that went into six and how, you know, it's, it's like a good faith measure. And then also it was discussed that if two, uh, if the Songon Bridge um, is the only one, there may not be an opportunity for a test of it, as as some are you know arguing that that's what we should be doing. Um, you know, so I I would think that you know we said in many meetings that if people don't know about what's going on, you can't make them. You know, so holding this open sort of, it felt like people were suggesting, I, you know, indefinitely or something. And I just don't think that, that that is commensurate with how we operate. And it, again, discourages volunteers, people who have put so much work into this. And, um, you know, I just don't see a real downside um, to, and, and the, the downside to waiting, of course, as I can just imagine, you know, if there's, developments or multiple developments that could have that you know where there was a missed opportunity that could have had a shaping by experts 
um, or, uh, or a more streamlined process so that, you know, that I'm not, not in favor of development. I am, I want smart development, development that, that, that allows us, like the farmer said, to keep what we have. And, you know, I, the word that came to me as I heard him talk was biodiversity. I mean, I am one to talk, you know, about how protecting, and I fully want to explain, you know, want to acknowledge that it's not protection. This is minimal acknowledgement. And so, but, but, you know, I work within the Milberg Preserve on a, you know, for many years. And, you know, I see what minimal protection that I've been working on, on the ground, you know, minimal invasive pulling it when you, in the scheme of things, it's minimal. It's taken, you know, days and days out of, uh, months out of my life. And that's great. But I've seen the habitat respond. And when I think about how we are missing an opportunity in the Plutarch wetlands, in any of these other C potential CEAs, I just say, why? You know, why? Because we want to talk about affordable housing. I want to talk about affordable housing, but it's not the time. It's not, it's like a straw man. I'm sorry, respectfully. It's not the time. This is the time to talk about this. I, I can't see everyone. I don't know how many people are on this meeting. Could be just us now, but, <laughs> um, but I know that, you know, people care and there are very reasoned people who, you know, who um, have come to speak. And I just don't see why, um, you know, we, we can't make a plan to hold the, hold the uh, public hearing open, you know, for a short amount of time longer. And I'm not trying to shut it. I'm just trying to say like, we, uh, we need to just sort of act, uh, you know, without just prolonging something. I, mean, I just don't, we could act like how we normally act when, when an issue comes up. And if it seems like people are done talking about it, well, we close the public hearing. So, um, yeah, so I just would love for, for the volunteers, for the sake of the volunteers, I think we have to, and, and certain volunteers, <laughs> we have to give some hope that we have, uh, that we will have a plan, you know, and then go to a vote. And then we'll potentially go on to seeker, you know, or like, it sounds like we would go on, but the question is one or two. So, um, well, Julie, we, I mean, just based on people's conversation, on people's comments tonight, if, if we vote. closed the public hearing and had the vote, it would be for what? Um, and, you know, that's, yeah. I mean, I, we have to, I think we have to ask if we've had a public hearing on two, I think we need to now find out if do we close the public hearing, have another public hearing for just one. And then, you know, so I think we need to find some direction. So my my preference is to, you know, we'll leave right now, we'll leave this public hearing open until the 15th. We'll ask what the procedure is. Uh, do we then have to close this public hearing? And we'll know by our July 1st meeting. And then if we have to, we can set another public hearing for just a single CEA. And then we can have that public hearing and then we can vote on that. That's, I, but I think we don't know all the answers now because it seems like the majority of the board is interested in one and not two. And we've had a public hearing for two, so I think we need to find out what, what the next steps are. I guess I would request that, that people, you know, maybe visit that area that, that is in question, that second CEA, the Plutarch Wetlands, uh, and, you know, just drive down the road and consider the issue. Because you know, it's pretty far from town. I just want to be clear. I don't think anyone disagreed <laughs> with the importance of the environmental impacts in that area. I think what I heard people talk about was um, kind of trying to come to better consensus among both our volunteers on the planning board and our own um, paid staff as well. And also kind of the need to look at a number of other important items, which um, I, I would say too, relative to how we show we care about this issue to our volunteers who have worked on this, we, we've now collectively spent hours on this. And I, I think that that shows a level of caring about it because I think there are a few topics that in the last 12 months outside of police reform that we've talked about this much. So I, I don't think anyone's not caring or dedicated to this issue. 
Um, I personally would like to see us come to consensus on this, and I think we, we can. I just think we're not there at the moment. Um, I also agree that I think if we voted right now, we would do the one, and I am concerned that since we did a public hearing for two, that this would be considered a substantive change if we were to strip one away, which potentially would have us have to re-notice the public hearing. I'm not an attorney. I just, based on some of the other ones we've done in the past, that has been um, an area of concern that we've been told about. And I just want to clarify, I am for critical environmental areas. I like all the work that it was done. I'm for more than two of those areas. I just want to be in a good process around it and in good consensus in our community on moving it forward. So it's not just conflating the two issues of, of you know, affordable housing. And this is like, hey, let's, let's move um, you know, in process. Let's move at the speed of trust. Let's get, get, get you know, and, and right now, you know, we have work to do on trust with our planning board and with folks, folks in that area. I wanna, you know, I'd like to come to consensus altogether, but it may not be possible. Do you think things will change in a year, David, with the planning board? I think when people get, when people experience, I mean, to say that we wouldn't have any, any applications in the, 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 uh, the ridge, we, we, we already would have had one. If this had been in place, the recent subdivision that we've talked about during these meetings would have needed a, um, would have been flagged as a CEA. Is that right, David? Which project are you talking about, Neil? Um, is it uh, Albany, Albany Post? Yeah. That, that would not have been on the Ridge property. That would have been a different, uh, you know, like I believe that was part of the Stony Kill CEA. Okay. You would, would know better um, about that. Um, oh, yeah, maybe, okay, I'm obviously not. I just wanna say, I don't hear anyone saying they're not for critical environmental areas, um, but, you know, I, I do I, think, I, can we maybe... go into the process that, that you know allows us to move and, and bring on the, the you know I was really trying to you know have the planning board come into consensus on more than two, uh, but they didn't and they weren't and the attorney and the and our engineer who sit at that meeting every day and are watching our process at every planning board meeting said they do not agree. In fact, one of them said it's overkill. We already have such strict things in secret. It's already there. So if you're going to do it, do it with code. Make, bring us code and let's put code in those areas and so that we know what we can and can't do. He said, this doesn't tell you what you can and can't do. So give us something real. Um, I I'm just, not that. I, I, this is just another I just, have, I just have to say, I guarantee other, another attorney, you know, for example, if there was a land use attorney, other attorneys would, would not have that same opinion. It's, it's not overkill. It's not overkill. It's by any stretch. Julie, he's our planning board. I know, I, I, I'm aware, and we change attorneys sometimes. Um, and we had an, a letter from an attorney tonight, you know. So um, it's, I feel like that that's that attorney's opinion. And I understand that it's the attorney we have for the planning board. I, I, but I also, maybe they, they should be speaking so we could have a real dialogue about, about the the you know rather than sort of just general ideas about um, their concerns. My 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 issues. We can continue to argue about one versus two or two versus six for the next year, or we can vote for one, which we know will pass, and then in a year from now, you know, people will realize the world hasn't ended. We've we've kind of reached a compromise. I know I sound like uh, you know mansion or something up there but i think you know let's let's try something out that everyone agrees on and turn our focus to like the million other things that like we don't have time to get done in a day and in a year from now a year and a half from now when we propose like the plutarch woods you know people will be like yeah seems like a no-brainer you know everything seems to be going fine up at um you know, on the ridge, you know, that's, that's why I prefer that one. I, I'm not, I'm in favor of CEAs. I like CEAs, but what I want to show people is that we can do these things and the world doesn't end. It is better for everyone if we have them, but why not do one, you know, the, in a year from now or two years from now, 
it'll be that much easier to do the next one. If we overstep and then there's backlash, right? We haven't done anyone any favors. You can overturn these as easily as you can create them. You can have a public hearing and you can say no more CEA. That's the extent of it. You know, it's that easy. So when we do this, we need to make sure we have buy-in from everyone or else it can get turned over just as easily. That's who would I'm, turn it over, Neil? Who, who would turn it over? Are you saying, wouldn't that be a it, town board? Yes. Do we Why would we do that? Right now? What? Because we, backlash? we could, we, if there is a, if, if people find that they don't like this, if we try to overstep and everyone realizes like, oh my God, what's going on here? We'll have a hundred people coming to meetings and asking us to change things. I just, right? this is the public hearing for two. And here we have so many positive, um, you know, people who feel positively about it. I don't think, I don't see the, the I'm, a backlash as a, as a likely, um, scenario if we do too. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I just Julie, feel like I want to be, I, I want to we say, uh, I'll just finish by me. I just want to say I'm very concerned about the, how this is not a show of faith to the volunteers who have spent huge amounts of time on this, three years on this. So I, it, we're saying that we like it, but it's not a show of faith. One is not a show of faith. And I, uh, that is, that's, you know, we, we've already said the, the bridge is largely pr protected and that we're not willing to stand up for, you know, something we believe in. I don't believe a black backlash is, is uh, you know, there's not gonna be a groundswell of people, you know, with, if we, with we go for two. I just, there's, that's the last thing I'll say maybe, but this is the, sh the show of faith would be to go forward with what we have in front of us now. And otherwise it's not, it's not, it, believe me, it's not. This is ready to go. You know, this is what we had before us. We don't have any other, we don't have a proposal for affordable housing in the Plutarch wetlands. You know, we have this and we have a lot of support for it. Do we have a motion on the floor right now? My motion would be to continue the public hearing to July 15th Prior to our next meeting on July 1st, I will ask the attorney what we need to do if we're going to go down to one, if we need to, if we can close the public hearing on the 15th and vote on one, or do we need to set another public hearing for just one? Or should we set that public hearing now as well instead of set, you know, continue the public hearing on two and also set the public hearing on one so we can start that public hearing um, at that next meeting and don't have to reset that meeting. I fear a backlash there, just, <laughs> you know. Ju Julie, I just, I guess I just want to say that, you know, when we were spoken to by the New Paltz uh, police reformation, you know, the, the, the thing that hit me hardest was if you guys gave any kind of attention to the folks who don't have the time to make your meetings because they're working two jobs or three jobs or they're trying to put their kids to sleep or whatever. If you gave just a little bit of attention to the needs of those folks, as even the, the 10% of the attention you give to the environment, you know, maybe it would feel a little bit more equitable in this community. Well, it, I, you're you know, gonna make some good. people who are trying to put their kids to sleep pretty upset by saying that. Well, <laughs> there's, they're I'm just, here. I'm just saying there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people who don't have their voice in this meeting. And, and we know they are welcome to come. Yeah, they are very, very welcome. You know, they are- Can't be the only place where we listen to their voices. All right, I, there's a motion on the floor, sorry. Um, I actually very much like David's amendment to it, which is just to set a public hearing as well in advance. Um, should we need to, should we find out that we have to restart that process so we can move this um, quicker if that's something we wanna do. Um, okay. so, you know, so if you're set the public then. hearing for a single CEA for uh, July 15th at 7 p.m. and uh, continue the public hearing for two CEAs for July 15th at 7 p.m. I I'm going to second that motion. I have a discussion point. Yep. Can we make it not the 15th because of how the police commission meetings make it hard for people who want to come to a public hearing? So can we make it next week? Uh, sorry, next meeting. 
it doesn't make sense to have a public hearing that's after a police commission meeting. We could do it in two weeks, I guess. Um, the one for two, I guess, because that's July the one we know first. we're setting. So we, it would be two weeks from tonight, oh, okay. July 1st. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Again, it makes volunteers perhaps feel better because of how that's not, it's not being pushed off. You know, there, there is, I would imagine some people feel a little bit, you know, of wanting to get this done because of how, you know, there could be uh, opportunities that are missed. So I, I'm amenable to that. I think I heard the board say that. So do we want to just amend that motion to say that um, we will hold uh, public hearing on the single CEA for July 1st? Yes. Great. Any other discussion on the motion on the floor? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And so we'll keep this uh, public hearing open till July 15th. Till we know better. And with that, we can I'm sorry, Neil, can you, can you clarify for me? This is a public hearing. Well, we could close, I could, I guess alternatively, we can make a motion to close the public hearing for the two CEAs. The, what we just said was a public hearing for one CEA. Yeah. And what I was requesting was that the second, the one for two is next week, or is next meeting. That's what I was requesting. Okay, so we'll, yeah, okay. Well, so yeah, that, make, that makes sense. Well, well, are we saying they're both gonna be? We'll have a, so yes, yeah, sorry, I, I was not, I was not thinking clearly either. So thank you for, Claire. so well, we have a motion to have a public hearing for the single critical environmental area of the, of the ridge, and then a motion to continue the public hearing for both on July 1st at 7 p.m. Second. Uh, discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you for catching that. I, I was still going down the other path. So, um, and with that, we can um, open the town board meeting, uh, make a motion to open the July, June 17th, 2021, New Paltz Town Board meeting. Second. Second. All right, uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. I'd like to uh, make a motion to approve the agenda. I have a few changes as well. Second, Alex. And so the, the changes, I would like to add three items to the agenda. The first is item 6H, uh, authorized payment of invoice 12296 from Masseo Landscape Incorporated in the amount of $990 from the Tree Trust Reserve Fund. And that is for the uh, planting for Carol Roper's trees. Um, item number two is uh, add um, to item two, to add uh, two items to that list, a 2004 international hook lift and a 2011 international hook lift. Oh, and uh, number three is a, um, I sent an email around earlier today. It's authorized supervisor to sign contract with uh, B&L um, for up to thirty thousand dollars for the bid, for bidding services, and that's that's all the changes I have. Second on the amended agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, and then so announcements. Um, I don't have any announcements. If anyone else has any announcements, um, if not, we will move on to the uh, public uh, input. And if anyone has comments, uh, please raise your hand, uh, star nine, if you're calling in. Um, and uh, Edgar, it's, it's been so long since we've heard you. Um, so please keep it to three minutes. I will. Uh, I'll speak to two matters, the agenda of the um, 
uh, the, the tearing down of the trailer, the, um, the, the CCC, the child uh, care center. I live next to it, literally. I can hear the children there from the zine, et cetera. I look forward to the discussion today, and I hope that the board is, uh, will be coming up with another alternative for child care in New Paltz. And that really takes me now into the previous um, a discussion that I just heard. I work very closely with poor people in New Paltz. I have a group of over 20 individuals that live on old Route 299, okay? A stone's throw from Plutarch, where I lived for many years, okay? And I also want to point out that I live here 50 years in New Paltz. I have 30 acres of Springtown Road that I developed and worked with, and I care and love that land and will be going back there again. So I know both worlds very well. Uh, so I heard tonight that poor people need to be concentrated in areas where they can walk to. The people that I have, and I'm going to invite Julie and others to come visit the conditions that they currently live on, on old Route 299, and show you why they need housing. If they lived on Plutarch Road, they will figure how to get around. So that's something that I find completely unacceptable. And I, and, and you know, we have a lot of privileged people here making decisions that affect very unprivileged people that are part of our community, that work in all the restaurants in Newport and that are part of our economy and the children go to school, okay? And I work with these families intensely as a volunteer family advocate. I am involved in many matters that go beyond policing. So I ask any member of that planning committee because the people I work with cannot go to those planning committees. They don't speak English, they don't understand, they don't have the children. They, they work 15 hours a, a day and they are part of our community. So I urge anyone from the planning committee, from the board, Julie, if she wants to come with me. I used to live at 138X Plutarch Road. The address changed, but it was right by the corner of the church and the gun, and the gun uh, and rod club. So I know both worlds very, very well, so those two areas. I think that we need to, that, that, that the people that are so concerned uh, about this decision is about to be made should also concern themselves with housing and truly show good faith by working with both. Thank you. And my phone number is 255-9652 that I have had for 50 years. You can call me. I will give you a personal tour of how these people live and we can walk from their house to Put Talk Road to show you that, that it is possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? If I could just say, uh, I'll send you a note, Edgar, because I think you really misunderstood me. I've said all along that this is not a, a, a something that would prevent development. It doesn't prevent affordable housing on Plutarch. It doesn't. Okay. And I like to talk to you about it. Well, they, but this this doesn't prevent anything. It's not protection. So I wasn't saying that we shouldn't put affordable housing on Plutarch. Can, can we talk personally on the phone? Yes, I'm, sorry about that, folks. All right. Um, so, <clears throat> item number one. Um, this is uh, the highway truck purchase proposal. Um, you know, Chris has sent this around. I, I have to say that. I really appreciate the, uh, the hard work that Chris has done. Um, I, I think he's done a fabulous job of trying to figure out ways to uh, save money and still get things done. Uh, I think this is a really uh, I think good approach. You know, he spent a lot of time working with Gene on this and I think this is gonna save the town money in the long run. And um, I wanna thank Chris for, for doing such a great job on this. And, and if anyone has any questions, I don't know if, if they wanna ask Chris anything about this, but... Um, Chris is in the meeting. No, just thank you, Chris. Um, I just saw you guys on the road uh, the other day, actually. You guys are doing an awesome job. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to second Neil and Dan on that, Chris. Um, I think great job trying to save us money, thinking ahead, planning for the future and how to keep everything going for our town. So um, thanks. Thanks from us over at the town. Thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, um, if no one has anything else to say, I'd like to make a motion to authorize the um, 
purchase of the uh, the proposal that Chris has given us to purchase the two trucks. Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 And uh, so number two, um, as part of that, we're going to be selling some old equipment to help offset the costs. So I motion to authorize to put out to bid for sale at auction um, the items I listed earlier. Those um, what are they called? Uh, those two hook items, the international hook lifts, as well as the uh, Bomag large roller, two digging buckets for an excavator, uh, the Paladin snowblower, the two Tarco Highlander sanders, the heel gate and the ox body for a dump truck. So these are, this is uh, old equipment that, that we don't need or we don't use and uh, we're gonna be getting rid of it to uh, help offset the cost of purchasing these new trucks. And so. Second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, thanks again, Chris. Um, and then a motion to authorize, or accept the resignation of Oliver Fisher from Highways. Second. Discussion. Um, I'd like to thank um, Mr. Fisher for many years of, of uh, dedicated work. And um, 18 years. 18 years. Wow. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, thank you very much. And um, uh, are we getting him a watch? <laughs> We're getting him a plaque. <laughs> <laughs> And 25 years for the lock, 18 years for the black, I guess. <laughs> um, all in favor? Aye. 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 And a motion to authorize the hire of Anthony Appel for the MEO position replacing uh, Oliver Fisher at the rate of 25.15 an hour beginning July 1st, 2021 increasing to 2624 in January 2022 and increasing to 2674 in July 2022 uh, based on the union contract. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and so now on to the, uh, the former New Pulse Child Care Center trailer. Um, so, you know, as you know, we've the New Pulse Child Care Center has been closed now for maybe a year and a half, two years. Um, part of it was there were structural problems with these trailers. They were never meant to, to be there for uh, 20 plus years. They were modulars that, were, that the school used to, uh, have for overflow classrooms. That's my understanding. They, then the program was started with the HUD grant. Um, and eventually, you know, when we had to close them down, um, it, we got estimates and the estimates to fix those trailers were well over a hundred thousand dollars. And we just don't have the money to do that. Um, the trailers have been empty for about a year now. We've had some issues with um, uh, fire alarms uh, going off, some electrical problems. Chris has helped and we've now separated all of the, the electricity is off. It's disconnected from the school. The buildings are physically disconnected from the schools as well. Um, you know, recently we had some problems. People smashed the windows. Chris had to put plywood on there. Um, I, I wasn't, I don't think it was the worst thing in the world that the trailers were there this year empty because it's not like the kids were ever in school. Um, being a little sarcastic because my daughter's supposed to be in school there and, you know, most of the year she wasn't in school. So it wasn't a big issue, but uh, now they're in school uh, at least four days a week. I'll take that. But um, they're going to be in school full time in September. And uh, I think, you know, Chris has, has said, you know, and he's talked to the school as well. They would like us to take, to take the trailers down. It's the problems there are only going to get worse. I think it's a liability safety concern for the town and the school. I think we've been lucky so far that nothing has happened, but I think we're, we're, you know. Borrowed time. Borrowed time. Thank you, Chris. And, and I think we have to, um, we have to take care of it and uh, the kids are going to be out of session. It's hard to believe uh, school is over. It seems like they only started like, I don't know last week, but uh, the last day of school is in like a week and a half, maybe even a week. 
Um, and so I think, you know, Chris has proposed that we take them down, I think sometime this summer uh, when there's no kids around. So it's safe. And, um, and I agree, I think we have to do it. We did not budget money for this this year, but I think we have to do it. Um, I think we could find some money in contingency. This is one of the things we put money in contingency for. I think if we try to budget for it in next year's budget, we're gonna be there a year from now doing the exact same thing. And the only difference is that we budgeted for it instead of taking it out of contingency. Um, and I don't really wanna wait a year to do this. I think it's the wrong thing to do. So that's why we're talking about it now. Uh, you know, authorize Chris to uh, rent any equipment he needs and to dispose of the, um, the debris. And so any, anyone else have any thoughts? I agree. So, um, yeah, um, so motion to, to authorize Chris to, um, to, I guess, take care of the, the trailers, demolish the trailers at the, uh, at the school. Second. Uh, any other discussion? Uh, Neil, just, yeah. just one thing real, I, I don't wanna, um, the building was left with all the equipment in it with the, the play stuff and, um, my, uh, my assistant, Dawn, she wound up working with volunteer organizations um, and she actually did it, most of it on her own time at night. And we literally got rid of, she got rid of 99% of everything in there to um, charitable organizations or daycare, state run daycare centers and things like that. Um, we literally took one half a uh, small dump truck load of stuff over the scale. Um, we reused doors from inside into the highway department. Um, so we, we pretty much recycled just about everything we physically could out of that place. So thanks uh, for the thanks. Thanks for doing that, Chris. Uh, it, 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 I, a lot yeah, of credit thanks, goes Chris. to my assistant Dawn. She uh, she she spearheaded it, and uh, she's a very kind-hearted person and wanted to see to go to needy people. And our thanks. I appreciate it. That's about the only good thing that came out of this. I have to say, I count. I still count this as a big failure. On, on the town's part, and I, uh, I'm not happy that we had to do it, but uh, you know, I think you know, I'm more than happy to try to, you know, try to find ways in the future where we can have a, you know, some sort of center like this. But um, you know, this one just wasn't going to work out. So I appreciate your and Dawn's uh, taking the lead on this and, um, and and fixing it before it becomes, I think, a bigger problem, which is mm -hmm. what it was going to become. So thank you, Chris. Thank you. All right, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, um, the consent agenda is motion to approve and authorize items 6A through 6F. I think it's through 6H, you added an A. Yeah, GH, yeah, I, I don't even know the alphabet anymore. Thanks, David. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, a uh, motion to approve officer Kaylin Marsh to a 90 day temporary full time position at the rate of 2262 an hour beginning July 11th, 2021. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, a motion to accept the resignation of full time officer Michelle Yeager, effective end of tour on June 22nd, 2021. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you for your um, service, Michelle. Uh, next is resolution authorizing the water line easement from uh, the New Paltz Fire Department. Um, this is uh, where we're connecting the water line on Henry W. to the 59 North Putt, the new police and court building. And um, they're allowing, uh, giving us an easement so we can cut across the edge of their property. Um, it, saves us the trouble of going around the corner where there's gas lines and it's very complicated. Uh, so we, we go more directly and we, we save money and we save potential complications. So uh, motion to um, uh, authorize the water line easement. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, next one, 10 is, um, you know, we've been asked by 
um, some people, um, several people actually, to uh, resolution calling on the U.S. Senate to pass the For the People Act S1 in the United States Senate. You know, I, I, I don't know how. Um, I'm not sure this is even still up for consideration, but uh, I think it's worth our um, asking them to pass this or something that does something to protect uh, voters' rights. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, motion to approve the June warrant in the amount of $1,077,513.59. Second. Okay. Um, and all in favor? All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to multitask here and you, I show you how good I am at it. Um, so the next one is the discussion to return to in-person meetings. Um, I, I said we would, we would have a discussion. I think I've had a, a little bit of a discussion with several of you about this. The, um, you know, the governor's executive order that allows us to have these Zoom meetings um, it has been getting renewed every 30 days for the last year. Um, you know, currently it's going to expire uh, July 6th. Um, my preference is to go back to live meetings July 1st at our next meeting. Um, you know, we are all vaccinated. The uh, CDC guidelines say that we can we can meet. Um, I think we would people ask people to wear masks if they're not vaccinated. Um, uh, but we would, I've, I've been talking to uh, Bob Fagan um, and what we have, what he has, they've bought it already. And it's a um, this thing called a Owl Pro. It's um, the, um, it's like a very fancy like camera system that we're going to be, we bought for the new courthouse. It's pretty mobile though. It's a small thing like this big. Um, and you just put it on the desk in front of where everyone is meeting and it has cameras that you know pick up every person who's talking. So we would all sit there at the, uh, at the community center and it would appear to everyone else that we're still in a Zoom meeting, but we're in the same room. Um, and so I think that's, we, we won't be filming them like we used to. We're probably not going to go back to that. This is our new technology. Um, you know, we'll be using that. We have to do it at the community center because the, it needs a strong Wi-Fi signal. And the Wi-Fi signal at the old courthouse, as we all know, was not that good. So you know, my, my motion is to have our go back into in-person public meetings, but we have them at the community center until um, the new courthouse is done in right now or on track to be done in you know August early August um, and so once that room is done we go back and we have our public meetings there but until then we go to the community center a second any discussion all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. Um, okay, this next uh, last item is the um, motion to authorize the supervisor to sign a contract with Barton and Legitus for up to $30,000 for bidding services. I sent this around earlier today if anyone wants to talk about it. The, and again, Neil, this is covered, uh, this is covered by the Plains Road project. Is that correct? Yes. 100% reimbursable by DEP. I've got um, confirmation from them that this is an allowable expense. And, um, you know, it, it means that we can start moving forward on that project. Um, once we put out the bids, we'll know, like, does this make sense economically? And does it fit within the money that we have been um, allocated or, you know, approved to spend by DEP? And so, but the first step is to get the bids out and get the bids back and find out if if it's doable. I'll second your motion. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. That's all I have. I think I didn't miss anything, did I? No, that's it. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, motion to um, adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.